Good morning. It is 8.30, and I'm going to call the uh, July 2nd, 2024 uh, Clay County Board of Commissioners meeting to order. First item we have is approval of the agenda. Second. Motion to second. Any discussion? If not, all in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Next, uh, okay. Next, we have citizens to be heard. Do we have any citizens present who have any, uh, want to address the commission with anything that's not on today's agenda? Steve, do we have anybody online? We do not, Mr. Chair. Okay. Next, approval of payment uh, of bills and vouchers. I'll offer a motion to approve the payment of bills and vouchers. Second. Motion to second. Any discussion? Not all in favor, say aye. 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 Oh, same sign. And next we have approval of minutes from June 18th, 2024. Second. Motion to second. Any discussion? If not all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay, next on the agenda, we have a request approval to hire a full-time deputy auditor. And Lori Johnson is here to present that. Lori, good morning. Okay. Um, I'm looking to uh, request approval to hire a full-time deputy auditor motor uh, looking to hire, uh, Looking for approval to hire a full-time deputy auditor motor vehicle due to his re resignation. Make a motion to approve the request. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Lori, are you, will this bring you up to um, your full staff? Yes, yes it will. Okay. Any further discussion? If not all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. That was easy. Yep, thank you so much. Motion passes. Mr. Chair, I have a question. Do we need a motion on the Board of Appeal and Equalization minutes, a separate motion to approve those? We had that. I thought it was under the consent agenda. Um, yeah, you're right. I apologize. Okay. Um, well, next, we have request approval to fill a vacant victim witness coordinator position. Ryan? Thank Elton, you, Mr. Commissioners, uh, the victim witness uh, department, uh, we had uh, Olivia Larson there. She's a part-time or was a part-time victim uh, service individual. That's a, it's a budgeted position. She'd been working on her master's, got that complete, and uh, now is a parole uh, agent in um, South Dakota. So she took a new job, and that position's open. We're requesting to fill it. Any questions for... Make a motion to uh, <clears throat> motion to fill the vacant uh, victim witness for native position. Is there any chance there'll be some kind of backfill on this? Or <laughs> no, I don't believe so. Second the motion. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Thank you, Brian. Okay, next we have uh, Michelle Carney, Victim Witness uh, and Diversion Director, Lucas Brandon. Program updates from 2023 and 24 school year for the uh, Juvenile Diversion Restoration Practices. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for your time this morning. Um, we wanted to provide an update for our 2023-24 school year that we had for the restorative pro uh, justice program and restorative practices that we had implemented for the five districts throughout Clay County here. Um, Lucas Brandon was a new hire here in December of 23 that started with our program. Um, so he had been started with the school districts December, kind of end of December of 23, 
and really um, did some initial training in restorative practices, came in as a former case aide with Clay County Social Services back in 2010, 2012. So that was great to actually bring him back um, from a former position here in Clay County. So I think having some understanding of that system and working with in some of the other systems of Clay County, it was really helpful, I think, to recognize how we all work together with uh, social services, county attorney's office, law enforcement, and then the school systems. And so um, Lucas came in with some training that we did initially, but then really got going into the school systems here. So um, this presentation really just, we put together a PowerPoint to show the majority of it is a lot of the demographics and the data that we collected that uh, took place throughout this September into May of this school year. Um, the first, you know, what I'll say is that this position was brought in initially through ARPA funding that we were able to um, achieve with assistance through the county board that we very much appreciate that funding ability. So that came in from 2021, 2022, and then we did receive additional funding through some of the um, public safety funding that we received. So that has helped us to really get established within Clay County school systems. Um, that's where we're seeing the biggest need. That's where our juveniles are at. That's where the issues are at. Um, that's where a lot of the incidents are happening. Um, the schools have definitely seen an increase in behaviors, in incidents, in um, essentially crimes that are happening. So that was our, our plan with the ARPA funding was to get into where those issues are occurring, um, be able to act a little more swiftly and have access to the kids in a quicker way. And so that's been what our plan has been the last two and a half years that we've had this funding. Um, and so again, with Lucas's role here the last six months, um, he has really taken that into a, a level that we haven't even had the last uh, two years prior, and some of these numbers will show that as well. Um, the first page, the second slide, was this traditional decision-making process. What we were seeing was uh, for restorative justice, our criminal incidents really were coming in through either the school resource officers and law enforcement. They were either getting routed through juvenile court um, or the juvenile diversion process. So there was really just two routes. Um, they were going through the court process or they were getting uh, rever uh, referred over through the county attorney's office or law enforcement. What we did on slide three is through those ARPA dollars, we were able to then offer us another alternative, which to provide um, school-based referrals. And so we created a whole nother process where schools can directly um, refer incidents to our, our program. And so that's the work that, that Lucas, is, has, Lucas has been doing. Um, so if you want to talk a little bit, Lucas, on how you're receiving those referrals from schools and how that's been going. Uh, sure, thank you. Good morning. Um, what I've noticed uh, in my time so far working this last six months is that uh, I've been able to build relationships within the schools. Uh, we have really good access. I can use their software to uh, help kind of get some of the, the data I need. Uh, I can reach out to the students. Uh, let's say a principal notices that two children, two students are coming to uh, disagreements that might lead to uh, some kind of a physical altercation, I can be alerted to that as a preventive referral, and I can go in using restorative practices, start talking to the people, start talking about what are the underlying issues, start talking about how can we make a plan to, uh, to keep out of trouble, to do more preventive work. Uh, and by doing this, uh, I believe that we're, and, and I get the feedback from the administrators in the schools, that we are able to actually prevent some of these crimes from occurring, and we are able to keep uh, more of our young people on that path to, to greater understanding and understanding how their decisions are going to affect both themselves and, and others, uh, how we can prevent harm. 
Uh, and in a lot of cases, you know, let's say a, an attack or, a, or some other kind of uh, disorderly conduct type situation does happen, well then I can get in there more quickly because we can, we can have that access, be more flexible, talk to the people involved uh, very quickly compared to a normal court process is what I'm seeing. And then our diversion program models have stayed the same. We have a couple different routes that we can go and utilize, which is great because it does fit the needs of different kids. But again, the benefit is Lucas is able to meet kids in different ways because he has access to them um, in that school environment. And so he's actually able to connect with some of those students and help them get connected to some of those services in a better way. Um, he can talk a little bit about some of the barriers that he's seen and how he's been able to kind of mitigate some of those issues in uh, those ways. Yes, so uh, one of the biggest things I, I run into uh, quite often is people have tech barriers. So let's say we have a, a vaping case. Somebody gets caught with a vaping device at school. Uh, we're gonna offer as a first time offender a diversion and educational program. Well, in order to do that, we've gotta have online access. We've gotta have some kind of a laptop or Chromebook to be able to do that course. Uh, and during the school year, the, uh, the administrators allow me, you know, I can take some time maybe during an advising period, kind of like a study hall where it makes sense for that student's schedule, and, and I can uh, pull that kid in and, and give them access to that tech. Now in the summertime, things are a little tougher that way, and I've found that some of the families uh, that struggle with, uh, you know, managing the, their, their time and their resources uh, need that little extra nudge, and so I've been able to meet with some of these students, help them with that technology, help to... Uh, provide a way for them to, to complete their educational course. Uh, that way, you know, we're not just kind of running out of time and, and we're showing that we do want them to succeed. We're, we're helping them through that process. Excuse me, Ms. Travel, do you want these slides on the, the public? Not... Oh, I'm sorry about that. Yes, thank you. Uh, no, maybe I could expand on that a little bit uh, by working in the schools, building relationships with the students as well. I'm getting some uh, some opportunities for them to access me directly to say, hey, Lucas, uh, I'm having this problem with this girl. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, I think something might happen. What can I do about this? And, and that's an opportunity that I feel is a, a really good one uh, where I have students reaching out to me directly saying, hey, I need some help with this. What can we do uh, rather than, than waiting for, for a bad decision to happen? With these last, um, so the last school year, so September 1st through May, um, this has been some of the, the demographics that we've served for um, this year. So we had um, a total here. Um, so this is broken down with our gender, race, ethnicity, and demographics. So this is how many um, the individuals and the juveniles that we're serving. So we serve um, juveniles age nine to 18 years of age. Um, again, this is the breakdown and kind of um, both based on male and female and then race and ethnicity as well. So that biggest population is at 13 to 15 years of age, which is kind of that middle school, which is really what we were assuming and kind of and prepared for. Um, but again, we are in all the schools throughout Clay County. Um, so we are, we're in Ulin, we're in Holly, Barnesville, Moorhead, and DGF as well. Um, the types of offenses that we're seeing, uh, this varies from um, alcohol, a minor in consuming, assaults, we've had burglary offenses, driving violations, drug and marijuana offenses, We've had hunting violations. Um, we've had kind of a catch-all other offenses as well. Uh, property damage, shoplifting, threats of violence, thefts, trespass, tobacco and vaping, and vandalism. Um, I'll let Lucas just talk maybe a little bit about that assault. Obviously, that's our highest level of offense, but I think also our opportunity with those prevention op options here that we're working through. Sure, uh, thank you. Uh, a few things maybe worth noting. I know that assaults or disorderly conduct category really jumps out on the graph here. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that is that is both charges. Sometimes a police officer will, will say it doesn't rise to the level of an assault. 
uh, but they'll come in with a disorderly conduct. That's also an opportunity to talk about choices and to, uh, to really kind of drive it home for these students that this is their one chance to get it right before we start having to go to court and having to go uh, through those processes. Another thing worth mentioning is that uh, those numbers are sometimes big. If you have two, two students engaging in some kind of a mutual combat, they're both going to meet and fight, well, they might both get an uh, uh, incident or a, a case out of that same incident, rather. Um, you, if you look a little further down on the, on the chart here on the graph, we see the threats. Uh, that number jumps out to me because the, that's not a charge that the police officers, are, they're not charging them. This is uh, preventive cases where I'm being told, hey, there's going to be a fight. What can we do to get ahead of it? That's a threat of violence. Uh, so that's a good representative of our preventive work we're doing. Uh, that, so in other words, I think that we would have a, a higher number of assaults if we, if we weren't dealing with these cases preventively. Um, one other thing, kind of an unusual one in my cases, or if I could mention briefly two of them. Uh, one is the hunting violations. We had some people uh, with some firearms in town, and, uh, and it involved uh, some wildlife. So we, we worked with the conservation officer. We had a, a conservation officer come in, meet in what we call a restorative circle with the children and their parents and myself, and we had that opportunity to talk about it. Afterwards, this conservation officer uh, was very thrilled with the program, was saying, hey, I wish I had access to this more often because what happens is people can either get, get hit with the heavy charges or they can get let off with a warning, and, and this kind of program allows that in-between space to talk about the seriousness of an incident without really throwing the book at somebody as well. Um, another case I want to highlight, one of our rural uh, schools, we had an offense, uh, well, it was a fraud case, uh, but we weren't sure what to do to address the harm that was caused. And so we, we were working with this student, trying to come up with a plan, how could he show uh, that he wants to repair the harm that was caused in this case. But he was out in a rural area, uh, and we didn't have a real strong program for community service there, so we were struggling with what to do. Well, we identified that this student was really good with uh, woodworking. He was really good with welding, and so he did a project using his skills that benefited a nonprofit in the area. And, and that was, I think, a, a huge success, a way to show our creativity and flexibility in addressing uh, how to repair harm. When we look at the numbers of, so we had 145 youth who were referred to our program in that time frame. So 42 of those were those youth-based prevention services for the school. So those school, they didn't get a hold of or connect with um, SROs. Those are directly um, cases that they're working, the schools are working with Lucas. So they're not getting law enforcement involved, they're not getting the attorney's office involved. They are connecting with Lucas directly, trying to prevent future crimes from happening. So again, that's kind of our, our goal, is to kind of alleviate that, that intervention piece, and so to work on that prevention. Um, so that was 42. I will say that the majority of those numbers came when Lucas really started in on that work, so probably that February to May. So that those numbers are really substantial. Um, I think he did a lot of work uh, in those early, uh, really middle school uh, ages for sure. I think not only at Horizon, but the Horizon East, but Horizon West, and really in incorporated a lot of services for those schools. Um, also, the school and community diversion, so that's really our typical diversions. That was 103 of our referrals. Um, so the ones that, of our referrals, we successfully completed 114 of those. Seven were transferred back to our referral sources, which means that those juveniles either didn't complete the program, maybe they picked up another offense and so they weren't appropriate for um, continuing on or maybe they didn't respond to us or follow through. Um, and then we have 24 that are still pending completion. Um, we talk about recidivism rates and so we had of those 145, only 4% uh, of those had a new offense. So we have 96% that were successful in no new offenses from there after completing restorative justice. Um, so when we talk about, uh, when I look at kind of a six month review, again, this is when Lucas is in this role and really kind of the work that we're doing forward. Um, 
uh, 124 of those because we did have a lapse in between where we had um, a coordinator ending his time and uh, Lucas starting kind of in that January. Um, most of our referrals came during that time. So this is where we're getting our referrals, our school-based law enforcement, the county attorney's office. We do have some from juvenile probation and Fargo court. Um, when I look at funding opportunities, we do get some funding from the Clay County Collaborative. Those help support some of the travel that, that comes with uh, the need for Lucas's mileage to and from the different schools throughout Clay County. Um, some of our scholarships that are needed for some of the juveniles to complete some of those online courses, our training budgets, um, some program fees, and just really um, some additional costs that those are covered throughout the collaborative. Um, he is also attending a national conference coming up here for restorative justice in Washington, D.C. Again, that's all covered through that collaborative funding. And really, I think this next school year, we're looking at providing more training throughout the districts to kind of make sure that they're um, looking at and kind of how there can continue to be more restorative practices and work through it. <coughs> within the school district themselves. Are you one of the schools pretty much every day or? That's, that's right, sir. Uh, my normal schedule, I'll be at the courthouse office uh, here a little bit and then I go out to the schools. Uh, on Fridays, I rotate through our rural school district. So I do spend time at, at the school in Ulan and Barnesville and Holly at the uh, Legacy Cooperative as well. And, and I've had cases at, at every single school, uh, opportunities to work with uh, SROs once they were back. Uh, and beforehand with the local police and sheriff's departments. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I would say the bulk of the time, uh, you know, if, if it's really quiet over at one school and I get a call uh, from, say, Horizon East that, uh, hey, they could really use me today, I have that flexibility to come running too. Uh, but I do have a set schedule visiting all the schools in the, mm -hmm. in the middle school and high school areas. Mr. Chair. Commissioner Mojo. Thank you. I appreciate to hear about the schedule. I think that was one thing that came out of the small group discussions that we'd had with the rural districts and, and Moorhead too, but to, to make sure there was a defined day so that um, you know you could have a portfolio, if you will, of, of cases that you could work through on those those days specifically and really utilize everyone's time in the best way. So I appreciate to hear that. Thank you. Are, are most of these kids, or all of these kids, have they, um, this is before they maybe have reached our juvenile detention facility? Right? Yes, sir. So this yep. is, uh, if I could say, this is a first time offender program by and large. Uh, there might be an opportunity uh, occasionally, let's say a, a, a student was involved in a, in a fight when they're in, in middle school and now they're in high school and they've got a vaping offense, we might offer a second diversion. It would be very rare to offer a third. Uh, they would have to have very extenuating circumstances. Uh, this is by and large a first time offender program to help kind of set them straight and on that right path. Mr. Kravinoff. What's the involvement, if any, uh, in your course of work, <laughs> involvement with the parents? It's a very good question. Um, so the, the involvement with the parents kind of varies on, on the severity of, of the case and, uh, and how it goes. Usually I have better access through the schools just because that's where the student is. Uh, we don't have to worry about do they pick up a phone or return a message and so on. Uh, but of course these are, these are juveniles so the parents are involved and are notified, uh, especially in the case when we have a uh, county attorney, when we have a citation going from the police to the county attorney's office, well we're going to have some degree of parental involvement. I'm picking up the phone and letting them know what's happening. Uh, now in the summertime what I've found is that because I don't have that great access through the schools as so much, uh, there's a heavier uh, parent involvement, uh, which has led to some uh, uh, kind of wider, we do these restorative circles, ideally, when, when everybody's on board, to come together and talk about an incident, to talk about what happened and what we were thinking at the time, how we've been thinking about what happened since then, uh, talking about what we could possibly do to repair the harm. Well, if I'm in the school and I've got two young people and, and maybe a relatively, relatively minor altercation, we can just talk it out and that's that. Uh, but if we have a case where we've got violence uh, that was going to be charged out, uh, where we've got four or five families involved, we end up with some more, some more extensive restorative circles where we, we really bring in uh, uh, this community involvement. Thank you. 
I just want to comment. I, you know, your numbers here and the recidivism is numbers are really good. I, it really shows, um, and and the fact that this is early on intervention as opposed to uh, some of our drug court issues that are kind of we're working with after the fact offenders. Uh, so this is this is encouraging. I, I, you know, sometimes we're questioned about things that we, what we fund and, and, you know, when we're keeping kids in their schools and keeping them out of correctional facilities is, um, is a really good thing. And I, um, I'm glad, I'm really glad to see these numbers. So, uh, I, I wish we could have as good a success for the kids who may be a little bit further along uh, that have, you know, created some uh, situations that put them into incarceration type settings. Uh, I wish we could um, get them to yeah. be as successful as these kids. Yes, sir. And I don't know. I don't know. Maybe there still is an opportunity to do that. But I don't know, was Brian wanted to Mr. Chair, if I could do it. Um, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Campbell, I think that's uh, you know, one of the points and why I asked Michelle and, and Lucas to come and present is just because we have had very good success. I appreciate the board's uh, support. I know when we went out and reached out to the rural uh, schools as well as Moorhead to really try to get it at that uh, baseline level, try to get to the kids as soon as possible. And so we are seeing that success, and you're right that getting there and preventing juveniles uh, from getting into the system or being over at the West Regional uh, Juvenile Center, um, you know, is important facts. And so that empathy uh, council or getting them, I, I, I wanted to mention, uh, you know, Michelle has done a great job over the last two and a half years of keeping the program moving and, and keeping it uh, going in the school, but also uh, getting Lucas here has really been a, a great, just a dynamic piece to, keep jump starting it and, and get and I think you see those numbers and everything I watched uh, we had a, a case the other day with some new Americans um, young men in middle school um, where they kind of had a, a I won't call it a gang fight but a bunch of guys and kind of picking on you know one other person and watched him bring all those families together and make them understand you know their actions and how their actions impact others and how even those in, actions of those kids was impacting the parents, and those parents were, you know, very emotional about it, knew each other some, and even within their own community, it, it was it affected them. And so, uh, I thought that was just a terrific uh, turnout and 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 result watching that happen. And so, um, we we see a lot of good from this. There is a great cost savings, I think. Um, I think that's just something that needs to be said, and I think it's part of kind of the last slide that. Uh, I think it shows that by preventing them from getting into the system, there is clearly a cost savings uh, to have this done early on instead of having to process and have two or three or four more fights. I mean, when they understand that they shouldn't be doing this and the impact it has, it's, it's pretty incredible. So we're glad we have it. I, uh, back in the mid-'70s, did an internship when I was in college in a juvenile center. Mm -hmm. And then I... Years later, I ran a juvenile and family investigations unit in another state. And when I got here, um, there was a real shift in how the community viewed our kids. And this commission has reflected that uh, to the point where it was very, it's been a very gratifying experience for me to be part of what we're doing here and what we're attempting to do. And we have commitment from individual commissioners here on a personal level to really try and make this work. But through all the time I've dealt with juvenile issues, I've never had a community that was this open to try to be restorative as opposed to punitive. But it, right now we've got a situation where we've got to look upstream. We've got West Central and we have a lot of kids. And we have very limited resources for many of their problems. You guys are the tip of the spear. Mm -hmm. If we can get these kids before they get into the system, if we can give them the, the, the skills that you're imparting to them and, and collectively imparting to them, bringing the kids together to realize what their actions are, 
And I think this is as critical as anything we have in our justice system right now, particularly post-COVID. I've got friends that are teachers, and the stories are disturbing. The joy has gone out of their jobs. The kids, one, one teacher told me they've come back feral. And this is not only a good way to deal with it, I think it may be the only way to deal with what a lot of these kids are going through. And I, I want us to be supportive of this, and I want us to make sure the resources get to where they need to go um, to, to provide these services to everybody. Yeah. And honestly, uh, Lucas, you it sounds like you're doing a fantastic job, and both of you. I know Michelle's been at it for a while, and but both of you are, are bringing something to us we very much need, and I think this commission's been very supportive of it. Mr. Chair, I, I, every, once, every now and then I'll get a message during a meeting from somebody, um, constituent or whatever, and I just got a message on my phone that says, Lucas is awesome. <laughs> so I just, I thought I would share that with you, that, uh, that I, I did get a message this morning about, about your uh, good work, so yeah. good for you. Yeah, and the couple of the last slides I just wanted to share. Um, the one is a, from Minnesota Management and Budget. It talks specifically about juvenile justice, the benefit and cost analysis results. Um, there is a report specifically about at-risk youth, uh, the importance of diversion, restorative justice, the cost benefit that it does to keep kids out of the system, um, that it reduces recidivism, um, and really, it the cost savings to free resources, uh, to schools, to courts, the victimization that it reduces, and the incarceration. So I did link that um, report as well. I'd be happy to share that too. Um, but again, I think it just shows the the uniqueness of what diversion does and restorative justice does on a pretty small scale. The cost that that offers. Um, to really divert some pretty high costs down the road possibly and, and hopefully we're showing that with with the work that's being done um, and really we couldn't do that without what you all have offered us with the chance through the ARPA funding that you gave us um, to, to get out into the schools and try something new and try something different after COVID and and really get to where the kids are at and where the issues were and so um, we just really appreciate um, kind of this initiative and it showed that getting to the kids in a sh quicker way um, where they are and a response uh, in a way that that I think is um, bringing them together and repairing the r relationships within the schools I think has helped tremendously so I just appreciate what you all have supported for the program too anything additional well, I'd just like to say I, I uh, very much believe in, in what we're doing, and I think it's a great use of, of my own time and, and my own efforts. Uh, yeah. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, and then there were a couple other um, letters of support that I submitted as well um, from the school, uh, two from the school districts and then one from one of our SROs. I think uh, uh, Commissioner yes. Mojo may have read that as well from Scott Steer yes. as well. So, yeah, thank you. Any other questions? I have one. Grab it off. So, uh, Michelle, is there, uh, ARPA funds got this started, but are there grants that you're able to apply for to sustain this for, or grow it? You know? Yeah, so in we have had grant funding in the past. Um, they're, you know, they are harder to come by. I mean, we're always competing with mm -hmm. throughout the state of Minnesota, and there are some um, youth intervention prevention funding. Um, we do seek those out when they become available. Mm -hmm. um, it's been a couple years since we had that funding. Um, those are always evolving as they come up. I do uh, attempt to to apply for those, but it has been a couple years since we did receive okay. funding for those. I'm sure glad the collaborative is able yes, to Yes, absolutely. Uh, They've been a great support. Yeah, for sure. Yes. And someday I want to see you juggle. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wondered if that might come up. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so for those who don't know, I, I have dabbled in professional juggling over the years, I, I, you know, regular juggling, but mostly I do a style called contact juggling that involves rolling balls on my body, uh, rolling 
uh, tricks. And so especially in our, in, our, in our kind of middle school and our core population of children I'm speaking with, uh, I use it as a tool of engagement. I'll bring a, a big kind of softer, safe ball with me, and some kids will call me the ball guy or the juggle man and things like that. Uh, but it, does, it gives us a chance to talk about serious issues, but also to show that we're, we're connecting on a personal level. And yeah, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, next time you can, uh, you, can, you can bring that and give it a little demonstration. And I, I would love to. Yes. Okay, perfect. Good. Any other questions? <clears throat> Observations? Thank you for what you are doing for our kids and our community. This is critical, and we're grateful for it. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks for your time. Okay, next up is Rory Schmidt, uh, Technology Services Director, request <coughs> approval to, of managed print service contract. Morning. Morning. What I'm bringing before you today is uh, our four-year contract for our current managed print services provider is up here at the end of the month. Um, so I was just going to give a brief history. So prior to 2020, when we signed that contract, we were spending uh, roughly $50,000 on uh, ink and toner for our printers in the county. So even after the first year of signing a managed print services contract, we were saving about $10,000 a year. So the first year we knew immediately that it, the program works, it's great, and it auto replenishes the toner. It gets delivered when the printer's uh, meter readings get too low, down to about 5%, they'll automatically mail out or deliver a toner, and staff puts it in. Uh, life is good, it's pretty, uh, pretty seamless for, for all of us. Uh, so today um, I received uh, three proposals from different providers and wanted to just run those run those with through the through them with you uh, the lowest cost proposal we received was through advanced business methods it's roughly uh, twenty two thousand eight hundred and fifty two dollars and twenty cents per year or uh, nineteen hundred and four dollars per month uh, the next one was Metro sales at 22,896 per year and Marco at 25,905 per year. And those, those numbers are pre uh, overage charges. So the way the, the system works is we estimate how much we're gonna print in a given year. And then either at that quarterly or at the end of the year, we have to pay almost a, like a true up of, of our overage charges. And those have been ranging about three to four thousand dollars per year. So with that, um, our, our current costs right now are roughly fifty thousand, fifty-two thousand dollars a year. So with these new proposals, it's it's almost half of that. So with that in mind, I'd, I'd like to propose that we make a decision to go with advanced business methods at the the lowest price. At uh, Nineteen hundred four dollars and twenty-five cents per month. Mr. I move to approve the advanced business methods uh, contract. I'll second the motion. Motion to second. Any discussion? <clears throat> if not, all in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Thanks, Rory. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, Justin. Justin Sorum. The county engineer. Yes, good morning. So we have a bid opening for SAP 14597003, SAP 14597004, and then an HEI 1915-0083. So these are all watershed projects that did receive bridge bonding for the two SAP numbers. And then we did lump together their final box culvert project in Dilworth. So we, we did receive four bids. All bids have a bid bond in the amount of 5%. The first bid we received was Celine Brothers Incorporated. Their bid was $1,033,472.00. $1,033,472.00. The next bid we received was from Central Special. Central Specialties Incorporated. Their bid was $857,385.00. And, 
$857,385.00. The third bid we received was from Gladen Construction Incorporated. Their bid was $829,243.00. And the final bid we received was from Lyle Wilkins Incorporated. His bid was $669,003.00. $669,003.00. the name of that company again? Lyle Wilkins Incorporated out of Crookston. We have not done any work with them, but I think he has, I did talk to him a little bit throughout the bidding process and he's done some work for the watershed before. So, Mr. Chair, if I might. Go ahead. Thank you, Justin. So the engineer's estimate was in the amount of 894,649, correct? Correct. So contingent on, um, contingent on bid review all with no errors on the bids. Are you comfortable moving forward with? I would be comfortable, yes. Recommendation then, Mr. Chair, if I might make a motion to approve Lyle Wilkins Incorporated bid in the amount of 669,003. Contingent on the Contingent on the review. Second the motion. A motion to second. Discussion, questions. Is there any timeline I see on the report there soon? Is that, what, uh, looking, what soon mean? Uh, so depending on when they can get box culverts, we had to open it up a little bit to where they can either do it this year or next year. My guess would be next summer construction just because box culverts are tough to get. But with bridge bonding, you want to open these bids as soon as you can, get the money allocated and in the process rolling and the box culverts in production. Are they putting in bigger box culverts? They're not. I mean, right now they're arch pipes. They are going to be a box. They're not near the size of what we have on some of our county roads, but it's through that ditch through town. Okay. Any uh, speculation why there's such a good price on this bid? Um, so I know recently, so the watershed in Houston did do the engineer's estimate and I looked at it. I thought they were, I thought it was high. I didn't think it was that high. Um, I know box culverts are coming down in price, which is good to see, but until I actually look at the bid numbers, it's hard for me to say exactly where the big difference was. Maybe a follow up to uh, Frank's question. Um, in terms of, you, do we, is this open-ended? Do they have for uh, an unlimited amount of time to no, do these? No, so or? there is a completion date of next summer on okay. the project. And then they, with the exception of they can't work during loco days. Okay. That those roads have to be open. Good, thank you. Any other questions? We have motion second on the floor, so. Proceed to a vote. All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Next item. Yes, so I am requesting approval to start advertising for an engineering technician or senior engineering technician. So one of our senior engineering technicians did put in his retirement notice. He's been at the county for 31 years and six months. So it's we knew it was coming at some point and he was gonna be a big loss, but with the timing of it, his last day is August 30th. We're gonna be in the middle of construction, so I'd like to start advertising now. Make a motion to approve. Oh, second. Yeah. Motion I, second. Kevin, do you have it? No, I just wanted to say that Justin did, did bring this before Highway Tracking 2 and Highway Tracking Committee agreed to, or, or did recommend this, this uh, request. Hey, any further discussion? If not, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Oppose, same sign. Happy hunting. Thank you. Next, we have Corey Bang, solid waste manager. Good morning and thank Good you. Good morning. Um, I'm here today to request approval for us to start collecting business waste on a day-to-day -day basis. 
Uh, in the past, we've collected at just special events because we didn't have a way to collect the fees that we charge. Um, so what we would propose is that we set up the line items in our computer now and collect them on a day-to-day -day at the, either the transfer station or the landfill. Um, it wouldn't create any more extra work for our current staff. It would just be a way of, of passing through the money. So um, we would ask that we could collect up to 300 units per customer and at the price that we have um, presented in the packet. So with that, if you have any questions, I would. Questions for Corey? No, I, I hear Just what's been happening up till now then? We've had just a couple weeks of collection, like a day here and there. Um, and they're required to bring them in at that point and, and you'll get a truckload. Uh, the last collection we had was only 10 people. So we had a whole day where the truck had to come in from from the company that collects them and they, they handled the cash. This way we'll be able to handle the money and just pass it through. Um, we won't make any money on it per se, we'll just pass the money through right to them and it'll go in with our regular recycling. So we'll just have a truck pick up and recycle a little more often. Yeah, thank you. And maybe another answer to that too is, otherwise they just disposed of them themselves in whatever way that they right. did. Yeah. <laughs> That's not good. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, they still could be Sometimes. legitimate, you know. But uh, and again, this this was also um, brought up through SWAC, and SWAC has um, recommended that that we move forward with this as well. Any other questions or a motion? Make a motion to approve the collection of business recycling amounts as described. Second. Motion to second. Any further discussion? And just a just a notation again that the the dollar or the prices that we have here that um, would be the fees are basically a, our cost to uh, move that through. So there's we're not profiting from any of this work. So just looking at this, just one question comes to mind. Looking at solar panels. Are we getting those in, and are they? Is it is, is it manageable? I, you hear all the horror stories about how difficult they are. We have started to get them in, and it's on a small scale. Um, you know, it's smaller individual type one house units, or like for a camper or something like that. We don't take industrial size ones at this point, and we don't plan to because they are really hard to manage. So this would be just for smaller units. Okay. Any other questions? <coughs> Not all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Thank you, Corey. Thank you. And we're going to take a uh, five minute break. Next up on the agenda, we're going to request appointment of West Central Regional Water District. Go ahead. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as you uh, may recall, back on May 28th, uh, this board uh, was uh, asked uh, to uh, to uh, provide three three members uh, for our newly formed or, or in the process of forming the West Central Regional Water District. Uh, the makeup of that uh, appointment would be to have two county commissioners and one at large, uh, at large citizen position, uh, and after an extended uh, extended advertisement, we had uh, two citizens here today uh, uh, who are interested in that appointment and being brought forward for your consideration. What I will do, and we have Ezra Bear and Don Martodam. Did I cor correctly pronounce your name? Yes. If you just both, you come forward and take a seat and turn on the green button on your microphone. And I'm going to, uh, Oh, okay. we've got uh, four questions here and then a, an open-ended question. What I'm going to do is just put, pose a question and I'll give each of you guys who alternate turns and who goes first and we'll work our way through there. Uh, first question is going to be, what motivated you to apply for a position on the Rural Water Board? And how do you think uh, your background and experience will contribute to the board's mission? And on this one, we'll start with Ezra Bear. Uh, I saw that you had an opening for it, so I reached out to Steve Larson and mentioned that I would be willing to sit on it if they don't find anybody. 
So that's why I put my name in the hat, figuring we need to fill that seat long term. Um, and why I think I'd be good at it is bringing a young voice and with it just just forming new, I think uh, a young voice would be good on there with knowing rural landowners and potential users of that said line of water. Okay. Don. Um, okay, so, so you're wanting to know what, why I... I, well, the reason I, I applied, I guess, is because one of the current board members on there gave me a call and asked if I would be interested in that, knowing that currently I'm not on any boards. Uh, <laughs> two years ago, I was on seven different boards. Uh, I dropped three of them. Last year, I was on four. And uh, because on the Holly PUC, uh, I'd been on that one for like 40 years, so when my term came up, I said, no, it's time for a new one. Uh, but that got me off of MMUA and NMPA. So I've been on the Holly PUC then for 40 years. Uh, there we had uh, water, electric, and gas. Um, so I've got experience with water only as it relates to a water tower and all the uh, the uh, things that go with it, hooking it up to homes and so forth. But uh, anyway, I'm board free, and I said, okay, I I I enjoyed being on boards, uh, and I've had I guess a lot of really good experiences. I could tell you which all boards I was on if you were interested. But but uh, over the course of the 40 years and the boards I've been on, I got to be on five different executive committees and we that, that hired CEOs. So I've helped hire five CEOs on five different boards. <laughs> so anyway. And with each question, I'm gonna any any commission meter members that after they've answered, if you wanna direct a question to either of the candidates, feel free to just pipe in. Any questions? I my my only thing would be is if they if they would want to know more about what this job would entail, I, you know. Yeah, the only thing I know about it so far is I met with Steve last week for what, I don't know, half hour, 40 minutes, and he gave me kind of a broad brush stroke of where we are in the, the history, the history and kind of where okay. you guys are trying to go with it or where the board is trying to go. Okay. Um, and it's interesting, I've never been on the front end of anything before. So, anyway, I, I've got an, a basic understanding of what's going on and where so you know as much the, as where, where they where they want to go. Yeah, it's a work in progress right now. <laughs> yeah, it's a work in progress. Okay, next question: Can you describe a time when you were uh, involved in a project or initiative that required collaboration with multiple stakeholders? How did you manage? Uh, differing opinions and ensure a successful outcome. And we'll start with Don on this one. Holy Freitas. <laughs> Being on that many boards, uh, anywhere from rural Minnesota SEP to both the public power boards, or three of the public power boards, uh, it would be really, I'd have to think about that a while because there's been so many of them. You know, we're collaboration, obviously, you guys are used to that. <laughs> You're, you know, you've got things that, brought in front of you every every meeting that you have to get together and collaborate on. I've enjoyed being on the boards in that um, I have learned that there are board members that are going to be somewhat out in front and vocal and there's the board members that don't typically say much. And I've learned that those are the guys I want to hear from those board members because they're really good listeners. And usually when they say something, I'm like, whoa, I've not, never thought of that before or I wouldn't have thought, saw that part of it hadn't you given your, you know, but your two cents worth or whatever. But anyway, uh, I've... I don't know if I can, a specific one. Uh, we've just had anywhere from state issues with MMUA, 
Um, on the political side, uh, we've had state issues come up, federal issues come up. Uh, I've been to D.C., I suppose, 20, 25 times over the years. Uh, down the state legislature probably that many times so I don't know I again I'd have to think a while if I was going to try and pull one out of the woodwork somewhere and, and make but working together is I enjoy that I I enjoy working with people and seeing other points of view Ezra can you repeat that question here can you describe a time when you were involved in a project or initiative that required collaboration with multiple stakeholders? How did you manage differing opinions and ensure a successful outcome? Um, so I used to be a member of a couple co-ops in the hog industry, and I was put on the building side of committee that to put up a new sow unit. And we had a wide, so the hog industry is very small, but it's very different minded people. So I was put on that committee, and we had to work through a lot of different ways on how to fo move that project forward. And then another, th another way, I also sit on the Gooseberry Town Board, which also has very different-minded people on there and how to manage through all the things that the town board has to work through. And you just uh, take everybody's opinion in and try to just work through it the best way possible. Okay. Any questions? Okay, next question we have. What do you believe are the most pressing challenges facing rural water systems today? And what strategies would you propose to address these challenges? And we'll start with Ezra. Uh, I think funding is probably the biggest thing right now. And how do you fund them? How do you get the lines ran where you need to get them? And you'd have to go to the federal level or the state level to get that funding, I believe. So I believe that's the largest obstacle with rural water. Okay, Don? Well, you'd have to obviously second that because funding probably will be one of your first big uh, hurdles to jump. And then I'm wondering what kind of authority the board would have. In other words, is this a really functional board in that it has the ability to affect an outcome or is it more of an advisory thing? I mean, I'm not real clear on that. Uh, you know, I, I haven't seen any definition on, on how that's going to align. Um, and then, you know, learning who you have to work with and, and, uh, and get, I, I don't have a good understanding of, of exactly, again, who it's going to affect and how. Uh, water's always been an issue, <laughs> whether you're in a small town or a big area. And I, I'm not sure what all elements of water this board is going to touch yet. But it, if it's just infrastructure or if it's a broader stroke and, and water in general as it, as it affects rivers and ponds and right-of-ways and all those things. I think Commissioner Campbell wants to respond. Well, I, you know, I, those, are, those are really good questions. And in terms, of, in terms of ultimately what the governance is going to be like, uh, the board that we're talking about and that you're applying for would ultimately have uh, probably authority is similar to a watershed board. Mm. Uh, however, I think uh, Ezra is correct and, and you are also correct in the fact that in order to establish this, uh, it's not gonna be able to be financially feasible to do without the assistance of state and federal. And we've, ma we've made that clear as a full board. We've all talked about that. And on, that, and on top of that, then it be, it's going to become user-funded. So, for example, as these trunk lines would go out, and there, you know, um, those would be hopefully paid for through infrastructure dollars by the state and federal. And then the plan would be that, um, you know, we would be able to find out which landowners are interested in tapping into that. And then there would be a local cost to them, and, and that would... Ultimately, I think the discussion has been is that would be tied to rates, like how much water is used and that type of thing, which you're probably familiar with in, in yeah, the work that, you've that, done. That part. Are there other are there other similar entities like this in the yeah, state? Yeah, so, so, so right now, Minnesota is way behind in, in the terms oh. of this, but North Dakota 
almost all of North Dakota has water districts throughout the state. And in, in, um, in Minnesota, there's one just north of us. Um, I think it's the Pope, what is it, was it? Frank, do you want to help me? Marshall. Marshall Polk Marshall. Uh, Water District. And, you know, so we're kind of piggybacking off some of the work that they've done. And then, of course, then another big issue would be um, where we're going to get the water from. And, and that gets to, um, you know, working with other entities. In this particular case right now, um, uh, East Central uh, on the North Dakota side is providing water across the river to a significant portion of that area up there. And the plan would be then that we could, and they're still interested in, in working with us. And that, is, that isn't to say that they're, um, or I hope I said that right, is it East Central on North Dakota side? Yeah, but there could be other resources. There might be a portion of the area where we might, you know, more public service might have an interest in, in providing some to some rural water. But all of those things are still, um, okay, you know, in the long term range. But that that's part of the development that you as a board member would be working on, and ultimately that board would have uh, some of some authorities. In it's ultimately the county boards who would make the decision if there was going to be any advance funding uh, on things where, for example, you might have a group of landowners who say, well, we want to collectively do this and petition the county to do it, and then maybe work through some assessment process. I mean, that's, that's just another option that's sure. out there. So I'm just trying to give you, yeah. pr provide you with some different things. But, but that board will ultimately have um, significant authority on governing okay. um, rural water, rural water systems. Yeah, one of the things that came to mind while you were talking actually was in the, the city of Holly, the Boughton edition. I don't know if you're familiar with that out on Highway 10. They've got mm -hmm. arsenic in their water. So there's been some general conversation about, hey, Holly, would you be interested in running uh, a line out to the Boughton edition and, and serving them? Conversation, mind you. Uh, there'd be a lot of hurdles to jump to. But, but again, that, that's, that's an exact type of a thing that, that a rural water governance mm -hmm. system could help in because, cause, because that, that rural governance could work on getting the funding for that infrastructure to move it. For, so Holly could end up being a resource to a certain mm -hmm. area, but Holly's got to be willing to do that. Right. You know, but yeah. Like I said, it's just been discussion yeah. at this point. Yep. And and that, okay. and formally sat down and tried to come up with a plan or anything, but... And next question, uh, describe a situation where you had to make a difficult decision that impacted a community or organization. What was the decision-making process and what was the outcome? And we'll start with uh, Don on that. And I can repeat it if well, you need me to. Affecting a, a decision affecting a, I've got one ear plugged this morning and I can't get it cleaned okay. until later today, so I. Describe a situation where you had to make a difficult decision it impacted a community or organization. What was the decision-making process, and what was the outcome? Yeah, uh, I mean, you, you're doing that all the time with rates, whether it's water rates, electric rates, gas rates. Um, but something that affected the community. Or organization. Hmm? Or, or an organization. Or, or organization. Golly, again, there's so many. Um, I don't know. It, it's that's a hard question. Only in that, <clears throat> when I look at things, <clears throat> I don't tend to pull out. Golly, I really had a problem with that one, or this one was a really because they're all kind of a big deal. I mean, you know, you're, you're every time you make a decision, you're affecting people. Might be different people with each decision but you're always affecting people every time you make a decision. Uh, maybe once in a while you get lucky and there's more get affected on a good way than a bad way, but uh, your, every decision you make is gonna affect people. So, I mean, I'd have to think about it if I was gonna pull one out of the hat somewhere because there's, a, there's hundreds of them in there. Okay. 
How about you, Ezra? I, I would have to concur with Don there. With sitting on planning and zoning commission, you deal with a monthly, and ev everyone deals with specific people with how, how the outcome might go. So, I mean, it's, yeah, I pull one out of the hat and say this is what made, that, that's tough to do because I look at them all as individual and have to work with, you know, work through each one to see, find out a, a reasonable outcome, so. Any up or questions or directions on that? We'll just proceed to the last question. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to share with the Clay County Commission on why you believe you would be a strong candidate for the board of directors position? And we'll start with Ezra. Uh, honestly, I think Don would be the perfect fit for this position. <laughs> <laughs> with, for how many boards he sat on, how wealth of knowledge. So that's, I, I put my support to Don, actually. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, it is worth I have trouble with the word wealth. <laughs> it, 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 is, <laughs> it is worth mentioning that Ezra is a candidate for this board, and he is currently running unopposed. Yes. And the position that he'll be taking currently is Frank's position on the board. So that is a gracious offer that I think many of us will will give uh, a listen to, but. Uh, Don, it's yours to it's yours to fumble. <laughs> Can you tell us? <laughs> but oh, one of the things that 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 I have collected over the years is a tremendous amount of contacts, uh, including last year I got to introduce uh, publicly in in D.C. Amy Klobuchar and Tina Smith. Um, I know all the representatives and senators in the state personally. I mean. Personally, being when I see them and they see me, we know who each other is. We've all we've had I've had conversations with them all. Um, so, and I'm kind of a I'm a centrist. So sometimes I'm middle right, sometimes I'm middle left, depending on the person, the situation, the topic at hand. But uh, I mean I. I don't have any prejudices on either side, other than I disagree with some of the things that happened in the state this year. And, and yeah. you're yeah. not alone. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> sure. Ms. I, you know, I, I you know I want to thank you both for coming here this morning. I think you both uh, would be excellent on there. I'm I'm glad to see that we. Uh, have two outside of the two commissioners uh, that we currently have, and we we need three. Uh, as Commissioner Ebringer mentioned, I know Ezra. You know, it's uh, you know, barring some very unusual thing, you will probably be serving on this board starting in January. And it's you know, I think it would be a strong likelihood that you would probably take Frank's position on that board. Uh, you know, uh, primarily because, you know, we're talking about where this is really going is to in, initiate and start the most would pr probably be in the rural northern Clay County. That's just the way, you know, unless we can get some activity that goings where we could start something south at the same time, and I'm not going to suggest that that's not an opportunity for us to try. But, I, you know, so I think in that regard, um, Ezra may be going on there in Jan, but I think... Don, I, I think you're, you know, I think you'd be a great, uh, and what, just with what you said right now, with your knowledge with both state and federal legislatures, we, we also need that right now. Um, it can be very helpful in terms, in terms of the funding piece and discussing the needs and promoting uh, what we want to accomplish. You mentioned arsenic. There's, there's arsenic not just in rural Holly. There's arsenic all over Clay County in the water. And um, so I, we have some really good opportunities moving forward. And, and um, you know, on our sheets here, we had a, an approved to appoint or do not appoint. I think both of them deserve to be appointed. Um, but I would, I would uh, Mr. Chair, I, I, would, I would move at this point in time that we would appoint uh, Don uh, to the board and that, and that way we can complete that resolution uh, that they've been looking for and um, and then I would encourage uh, Ezra these meetings are open and if you would like to be able to still attend those meetings uh, to kind of 
get your foot in the door with what's in the process, you'd be welcome to do that. I, I will take you up on your offer there. All right. So I admit that that was a motion. Uh, that was a motion. Do we have a second on the motion to appoint Don, the better. Don uh, Mart Martin da Marta Dam. Marto Dam. Yeah, it's Martin and it's O Dam. <laughs> Marto Dam. <laughs> I'll, I'll second the motion. A motion to second. Any further discussion? Uh, Mr. Chair, as part of the uh, the board agenda item, we're currently in a, in a little d different situation with the with the steering committee moving towards the board of directors. We don't have a funding stream uh, for for a per diem, but uh, for your consideration today, I would ask that uh, you maybe have a, just a brief discussion of whether or not there should be per diem and mileage uh, presented to uh, to this board member paid through Clay County. Mr. Mr. Chair, I 100% I believe that we should have that per diem and mileage. Uh, and, you know, and I, just a fair warning, these meetings can last a while. Some of them, some of them can be three-hour meetings, yeah. you know, so, so that does happen. So, um, Will you include that in your motion? Yeah, I would. Well, I'll just do a, that motion. Have we voted on oh, that? No, we haven't voted on that yet, but if it's going to apply to to the uh, board members as well, it would need to be a separate motion. Well, we, we're already. Yeah. Uh, okay, Mr. you're already. Mr. Chair, I, maybe if we can just vote on the motion and then I, or if we haven't, then I'll deal with the per diem. We have not voted yet. Okay. Do you want to include a per diem and mileage on that? Huh? Yeah, okay. Let's just vote on this motion and then we'll deal with the per diem separately. All in favor of the motion, uh, Don Martodam be appointed. Say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Mr. Chair, then I would also move that we approve um, the um, $100 per diem plus mileage uh, for traveling to and from uh, necessary meetings and whatever. Yeah, th th that'd be for the meetings, yeah. I'll second. Okay, motion second. Any further discussion? Mr. Mojo. In regards to the form, the I mean, we have something for planning commission that we give members when they attend. Can we just duplicate something mm -hmm. like that so that board sure. members can? We will do that. And you know, and, and as a board member, I you know, I, I you know, I think the per diem that I talk about would be for the meetings. But there, I, I can see a time when there's probably going to be the need to do other mileage travels for mileage. So I, the mileage uh, would be open to anything that would be done. Uh, as as it pertains to the job duties, so I mean, it might it might mean driving to um, talk with other people, you know, cities. I I would never turn that in anyway. <laughs> um, well, I, but it's I, MMUA. I was on for six years. I was president for a year. They, I've never got a dime, not even a penny from well, them. West Central just paid mileage, so I mean, I whatever. Yep. It's well, not, no, that it's for me, it's not about that. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay, we do have a motion to second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Gentlemen, thank you both. And yeah, thank you, thank you for your time. Board, Don. And, and I think we'll, um, Steve will work on getting, um, through Steve's, Stephen Slick, we'll, we'll get you regular invitations to when the meetings are and, and maybe we can send them to Ezra as well. I know he will. <laughs> yeah, okay. Next up. I was just gonna say as a matter of information, the next water district meeting is at Halstead at 830 on July 29th. Tried. <laughs> okay, next. GIS and communications. I've got everything lost up here. <clears throat> Proceed. I'm Thank sorry. I'm uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. It's uh, my privilege and honor today to present the uh, proposed budget for the GIS and communications department for 2025. On our main main budget items, uh, we kept everything 
the, the same they, as they were, except we had a couple minor adjustments just for because there's some costs that go up, uh, specifically data processing and supplies, which is our expendable items and software. Those things keep going up in price, so we keep uh, having to slide those up a little bit to cover that. Um, so the, the main budget itself doesn't change much. It's uh, the, one of the big significant no things you'll notice here if you look at our percentage change, it's a large number. It's because we added a staff person that uh, last week when I was here, we moved a staff person into our budget. So that makes the whole budget look, uh, it makes me look a little bad, but it's, 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 uh, that's why the big change is. I think the thing I want to talk about most today is our, we, this year we're bringing forward a new budget request. Um, it's uh, something we've talked about for a while internally and we finally decided it was time to bring it forward. We have a GIS technician that works for us. The GIS technician is a variable hour position presently, has been always. Um, and we are, our proposal is to bring that position to a full-time permanent uh, slot. So that, that change from changing it from variable hour to full-time is a $44,000 ask is what we're here really to talk about. In your uh, agenda item information sheet, I listed a whole bunch of reasons why we think that's uh, needed now. Our GIS is a very robust and very accomplished system, and it does a lot of wonderful things, and our foundational work that we do is good, but we're never, we haven't been able to keep up with the requests that we keep getting, and we keep prioritizing and working on things as we can. So uh, in there, I listed a whole bunch of projects we've got sitting on basically in queue waiting to move as, as fast as we can work them in. And we will continue to do that as regardless whether or not we get this position, we'll just keep working down a list of things people need and provide them with the data that they need. But that was probably the biggest driving reason for asking to change the status of this position. Is, um, one thing I want to note is in the 1996 plan that outlined how we should set up GIS here at the county, it li listed three staff members. Um, and uh, we originally asked for the GIS technician and it, get, it was a variable hour and then we asked again and they gave us a, a, a second variable hour for a while until 2009 when we gave them both up because of uh, some things that happened that year with, the, with everybody's budget. And then now we're back to just one variable hour. So this is the position that hasn't uh, changed for 25 years. Uh, our uh, the GIS division itself hasn't had any staff changes in all that time really either. So um, I think we've done some pretty tremendous stuff, but now we're asking for a little help, more help. Mark, you've done some good things on the 911 issue with this GIS and some other things, but at times we've had to hire contracts to deal with that. Any idea what the those contracts, they, we will no longer have to right. contract any of the work out. Correct. Um, we'll still use contractors, but we'll use them for a different scale, scope, a mostly different scale, much more technical stuff. But like last year, a good example, I came here to you folks uh, late last year and asked for uh, $20,000 of uh, public safety funds just to help us finish up hiring help to help us finish it up because we didn't have enough staff time to do it. So yeah, there's some things that we can do better internally. I think it's more cost effective and it's a, it's, it's, it's not, uh, I think it's a really good thing for us. So the $44,000 ask is not necessarily $44,000, some of which we wouldn't spend on contractors anyway. Perhaps, yes. And uh, uh, yeah, so I know Rory gave up some money this morning. He's saving us some dollars, so I'm I'm in line to get you, those. You right? want to steal it. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to leave it laying around. Talking, Rory says, tell him that I, I said I, that I could have that. Heaven, <laughs> heaven anyway, so that's... Uh, oh, one of the other things I wanted to mention on our software went up. Uh, mm -hmm. one, one of the things we're taking over uh, as a department is our... We have a large so, uh, software we purchased that does our forms, our online forms. Uh, it was in HR's de department before. Now it's moving to ours. So you'll see it go out of his and into ours. But... That's it. Um, any other questions about about this? Any questions? You covered it well. Thanks. I have one more thing I want to talk about briefly is that we also oversee the uh, section corner remonumentation project. And that budget uh, was $42,000, which will continue on. If you remember last time I think we talked about this, we were applying for a grant to get some money to help with that project. We were not successful in receiving a grant. Um, there were 65 counties that applied for the money. There wasn't enough money to go around, so only 30, 
four of them actually got money. Uh, the rest of us didn't. And that's probably, and it's, you know, it's kind of one of those things that's good and bad. It's the reason we didn't get selected is we had enough work already done. We had been, because we have a program in place to do this. So they were look, targeting counties that didn't have that. So it's kind of a win-lose thing for us, but I'm really thankful for that project and it's, it's doing a good thing. Right now we're working to finish up a Holly Township and we're working along that east side of the county to clean up those section corners and we'll slowly just keep working our way along and it's, it's a good thing, so thank you for that. Any questions for Mark? Thank you, sir. All right, thank you very much. Okay, we've got Quinn and Quinn. I keep wanting to say Jaeger. It's Jagger. Jagger, you got it. <laughs> and Rhonda Porter. Rhonda just looks happier. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> Do I look 10 years younger? <laughs> welcome back and welcome. Good morning, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. Um, we're here to present the 2023 budget overview and 2025 kind of preliminary budget proposal to you all. Um, noticing a big difference, it's going to look way different than what Mark just said. So just want to preference <laughs> that by saying these things are not the same. But, um, I think we'll let Rhonda do the 2023 um, review, and I'll, I will handle the 2025. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Commissioners. I told Quinn it's only fair that I come and speak to 2023 and why we ended the way we did, and uh, then he could jump in on the 2025 uh, proposed budget. So in your packet were multiple handouts. Um, the first uh, page in your packet is a summary of 2023 revenues over expenditures. And I'll just kind of go through a little bit how I laid that out. Um, we were actually $552,445 revenues over expenditures for 2023. But if you recall, as a board, you also decided to um, utilize $350,000 of our fund balance. So we did not use that, of course. So really looking at both those two factors, we were a little over 900,000 that really we were revenues over expenditures if you consider what you had planned to use in reserves. So going back to that first page is a, a high level summary of how or why that happened. Uh, the first piece in there, I always look at our salaries and benefits. And so what I simply do is I look at what did we budget in 2023 for salaries and benefits and what did we actually spend? And in this case, we underspent by a little over 65,000 in our salaries and benefits, which is really good because in years past, we actually other times were more than that. We had some stability in staff. We have more turnover that happened probably in 2024, but um, so we were uh, fairly close to budget in that area. Um, then what the next thing I usually do is I look at all of our administrative expenditures, which are spread throughout the budget um, in three different areas. And again, I look there, what did we budget and what did we actually spend? And those are all things like rent, Paper, pencils, uh, professional services, mileage, training, all of those kinds of administrative expenses. And we were 30169 under budget in those areas, which was actually pretty good as well. Um, then the next big item I look at is how did we do in out-of-home placements? Because that, that is an area that generally impacts the budget, as you know. We were 448,000 over budget in out-of-home placements. And Quinn's gonna talk a little bit more about that as we tried to consider that into the 2025 budget because we are struggling uh, with some of our expenses and revenues in our placement areas. Um, then I look at all of our purchase services. So these are all of our contracts with providers where it's very client specific services. And we were 617,000 underspent in our program areas. Um, one thing I would note there is obviously we look at um, 
what is our history when we go into 2025 budgeting. So I looked at what did we do with some of that program underspending in 2024 and 2025. And we've reduced those purchase services by close to 300,000 over 2024 and proposed in 2025. And so Quinn will talk a little bit more about, about specifically those. Um, so those, that's the expenditure side. Then on the revenue side, I look at all of our revenues. Where did we come in high? Where did we come in low? Um, net all of that out. And over the course of the whole budget, we were $786,000 we received in revenues over and above what we budgeted. Some of those are based on activities of our staff their work and some of them are based on some allocation adjustments that came in after the budget were set which is not uncommon in our budget as you know <laughs> um, over the course of 2024 and 2025 we did increase revenues um close to 400,000. so you're going to start to see that level out here as as into 2025. And then we had two kind of unique things that generally happen in our budget. Sometimes we get revenues or expenditures after the budget's been closed. In this case, we got a revenue um, that was supposed to be in 2024 that was receded in 2025, or I'm sorry, 2024. And then we had a, a unique reconciliation payment from DHS. Um, DHS had found some errors in their formula for some allocations that the county gets and they corrected that and it was a one-time payment to our county as well as other Minnesota counties and our share of that was the 160. So those are some unique pieces. On the next pages in your packet is really the detail that's associated with those lines for you to see exactly kind of what budget areas you know, um, were considered in the over or under spending. And then um, I had made a note on the side of each of those how we handled that going forward into 2024 and 2025 budget. So I won't go over all those in detail, but they do give you the history of, of those particular line items. Any questions on any of those? We'll go into 2025. I'll take it from here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioners, I will um, present the preliminary 2025 budget. Um, you can see in the other handouts that you have just the budget review document. Um, you can see the 2024 levy request was about 13.7, almost 13.8 million. Um, we are requesting, this is the preliminary budget um, preface this with, I know there's some work that needs to be done, um, but the preliminary levy request is going to be 14 million eight hundred and seventy two thousand six hundred and ninety nine that is a one million dollar difference um, or seven point eight six percent a, a big thing uh, that Rhonda talked about that I will probably harp on as well is the staff salaries and the costs so that seven point eight six percent does include the three percent cost of living adjustment as well as the nine percent health insurance increase that we're going to see um, which impacted this, this dollar amount quite significantly um, there are two new requests in the 2025 uh, budget that are not currently included in the levy. Uh, we're considering a full-time office support specialist. Uh, the total impact or cost to that, uh, that position does participate in the Federal Financial Participation, or FFP, where we are able to claim 50% of the salary um, and gain that back in revenue. That would have an impact of $41,555. Um, and we are considering, um, are anticipating the growth or expansion of staff uh, in 2025 and you know the conversation or, or the idea of this has come across your way as well but the fourth floor public dis defender space um, if, if that is something that we're gonna move forward with or consider we wanted to budget in and be transparent about that so half a year's worth of rent assuming that uh, that their lease would end in uh, June of 2025 would be twenty thousand five hundred and sixty dollars um, I wanted to just kind of bring that up today. I, I would anticipate scheduling separate um, 
board agenda items to bring those and talk about them in greater detail, but just wanted to kind of put them on your radar for right now. Did also want to highlight um, an estimated fund balance of social services currently uh, 11661000 and some change there. Um, that does include our estimated revenues for 2023 that Rhonda just talked about, um, but wanted to provide that as just kind of a snapshot in time of where we're at right now. Um, wanted to speak to as well the, the biggest items that are most impacting this 7.86% increase here, and salaries is a, is a huge component of that. Uh, you can see with the 3% cost of living and the 9% uh, increase in health insurance, that accounts for 787000 of that $1,084,000. Um, we do have an attachment one, the, the staff salaries worksheet that provides a little bit more detail as to the impacts that the salaries have on the overall budget. Um, we also have the healthcare unwinding money and the federal, uh, federal financial participation for the four eligibility worker positions that we brought on. We wanted to highlight that separately as that was kind of the one-time funds uh, to deal with the healthcare unwinding. Um, so that, that's covering four full-time positions in our financial services division. Um, we did make some uh, uh, adjustments as needed, again, the administrative adjustments, uh, kind of to piggyback off of what Rhonda was saying, things like rent, uh, building insurance, paper, pens, uh, slight increase of $7,400 there. Um, did talk to Kathy McKay Public Health as well, uh, got a, an increased uh, anticipated amount for detox um, of $350,000. I think they're gonna need that with their expansion over there. Um, I know that that comes uh, with the social services budget. So there was a pretty significant increase from 2024 to 2025 when it comes to detox. Um, as Rhonda also said, we, we wanna be able to respond to this trend in out of home placements, um, which has increased unfortunately over the past several years now, um, but also didn't wanna dramatically impact the levy and kind of make some adjustments over time. So we did increase the out of home placement expenditure budget, uh, $221,000 uh, to attempt to kind of account for how much over we were in 2023 and kind of trending in so far through 2024 as well. Um, well, we'll speak to it a little bit, but it, it seems like the cost of the placements are increasing, but the, the primary concern with the placements is really the revenue. Uh, we've, we've lost a significant amount of revenue when it comes to placements with the changes that government's made to Title IV-E claiming and a lot of our uh, placement locations not being able to claim IV-E payments for. So that's, that explains the decrease in that, in that revenue. Um, the county funded burials uh, also seem to be something that increases as well. Uh, we did account for an additional $20,000 to anticipate the increased cost in that line. Uh, it, it really does seem that uh, funeral costs are increasing, um, and just the cost of doing business is increasing. Uh, that is a mandated service uh, that, that we need to provide. Uh, we do have uh, kind of a policy that explains how to request a county barrel and what that procedure looks like to you know keep uh, keep it under control. But we are anticipating an increase in that line as well. Uh, is that a is that a, a percentage increase to the funeral homes? Uh, that, that's just overall increase based on trends and, and historical usage. It wasn't a specific adjustment to the funeral homes. It's just looking at kind of, it, it's, it's hard to anticipate exactly what's going to happen because we've had some pretty horrible situations happen and we've blown past that budget item by $80,000. And now that's not something that we would want to correct for because we can't anticipate you know, a horrible situation like that. So it isn't based on a, a, a COLA for the funeral homes, more so than it is based on Excellent. how we're, yeah, uh, yeah, projecting out the the trends. Yep. Ms. Chair, Commissioners, I'll, I would comment as well. Usually around October, we do want to look at those rates, and they do. Most of the funeral directors do hope that we'll be able to increase those service rates. But um, for the biggest part of our plan, is we put in there, we'll cover certain things at cost. So as those costs increase. We've already committed to paying the cost of those things plus a percent. So usually, so yeah, it is that 20,000 is kind of a mixture of those things, but they will be looking for us to increase the service rates probably around October. We'll have that conversation. 
or I should say Quinn will have that conversation. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, another mandated service that also seems to be impacting the budget uh, yet again is the nursing home uh, under 65. We, we pay a share of that um, for anyone under 65 that has to enter a nursing home for uh, over 90 days. The county has a share of the cost of that. Um, uh, that's a very unpredictable line as well. We never know when an individual is going to need that um, and we really can't control when that happens and and how long that's going to happen uh, so in anticipating um, again with the costs of nursing home care going up and staffing needs in nursing homes we're anticipating that our costs will also increase uh, so we've increased that by fifty thousand dollars in that line um, with the contracted providers and now we are talking about uh, cost of living adjustments for our, our contracted providers there there is a an increase of thirty thousand five hundred and seventy five dollars um, if you look at the second page of this it kind of breaks down exactly the contracts that that are referenced and what the percentage change is so I'll kind of briefly go through those uh, pretty close to a three percent across the board with some small changes um, our LSS contract for guardianship work uh, we've increased five percent uh, that's pretty difficult work and it's and it's vital to our needs um, and we uh, thought a five percent would be appropriate given the work that LSS is doing for us in that program um, also a place for hope uh, instead of a specific COLA adjustment there was a uh, request to cover what are called cam charges so uh, common area maintenance such like snow removal lawn removal uh, it was a specific request versus a cost of living adjustment that we felt would be appropriate to cover for the Place for Hope uh, contract. Uh, so total for the contracted provider increases is again at $30,575. Uh, we also have now our CaseWorks program in all of our program areas. If you're not familiar, need a refresher, that's our electronic filing system that we've implemented to get rid of hard copies and, and paper files. Uh, there are some adjustments to those uh, to the tune of $15,700 that will come with, uh, again, the COLAs on those contracts. And the uh, also referencing those decreases in revenue, um, kind of looking at our trends and looking at uh, kind of some of the allocations that we get or anticipate that we know I've learned in this process, as Rhonda said, it is quite annoying to not know what these allocations are going to be when I'm presenting the budget to you all. Um, I would like to have every red cent accounted for, and it seems like that is not the case if we don't know when we're going to receive these allocations. Um, that being said, we know a little bit about what we're going to get and have placeholders in a lot of the other line items similar to what we were allocated in 2024. So you can see in revenue decreases, um, just to highlight one in particular, uh, there are DUI court fees that have been received by social services for a few years. Uh, however, looking over the language in the statute, um, having some conversations with our sheriff's office, it seems like those funds are most appropriate to be allocated to the sheriff's office versus social services. It's really intended to support the officers that are making those arrests than it is for social services. So that money will move over to the sheriff's office. Um, uh, also with the opioid funds, um, that was a pretty significant decrease in what we were anticipating uh, to 37,269, um, as well as our stay grant uh, for kiddos that are in extended foster care uh, and our child, children's mental health screening grant had some decreases as well. So you can see our overall revenue decreases is uh, about $80,000 there. Um, we did have some program expenditure decreases uh, that, that Rhonda referenced, trying to make some, some cuts where we can um, to kind of account for these trends in the program underspending. Um, so it might be helpful to look at Rhonda's 2023 year-end budget review in that note section as well um, to explain uh, kind of the trends and, and our response to cutting where we thought it would be appropriate. Um, our substance use uh, county share line uh, Agencies that are performing this work are getting better at billing insurances, and so we're seeing utilization of the county funds decrease because they're getting better at, uh, and at billing the client's insurance versus relying on the, the county share for that. Um, decreased our DT&H uh, slightly. 
uh, as well as our sheltered employment. And then I wanted to also highlight our volunteer driver and supervised visits contracts as well. Um, we've decreased in those areas um, because we have uh, case aid positions and we've been utilizing our case aids a lot more to fulfill the functions uh, that we were using volunteer drivers and supervised visits for. Um, we also don't have as many volunteer drivers as we did at one point in time. I would definitely like to see that increase because it's a wonderful program. But right now, we just don't have a lot of them. So uh, with that being the case, made some cuts there as well. Um, I know for a couple of years, uh, we, and I know a lot of you in, in my previous role, I talked about uh, my passion for truancy and educational neglect. And we had set aside $50,000 that used to be accounted for the TIPS program. You guys remember what that was, the truancy intervention program um, that kind of dissolved over time, but we had earmarked that money to try and come up with a good solution for truancy. Um, it does kind of pain me to say it is not enough to make a meaningful difference, and with the difficulties that we're facing with the out-home placement side of things, we kind of got rid of that $50,000 and are using it to help out with the out-home placements. Um, I think it's not uh, the truancy aspect is not something that I want to lose focus on, um, but I think it's just something that we'll have to be a little bit more creative and outside of the box to continue to address. Um, but I am hopeful um, with this school year. Uh, we've de developed a pretty good partnership with Moorhead Public Schools in particular, trying to combat the chronic absenteeism that seems to be rampant in the schools. Um, do we have some revenue increases that we're anticipating as well? Uh, Again, the detail is on that second page uh, in some of our program areas specifically, but the overall revenue increases that we're anticipating, 159,500. Um, I'm not sure, when it comes to the revenue increases in, in particular, uh, one thing I wanted to highlight was the treatment coordination and assessments for uh, substance abuse disorder um, with the uh, reform that that took place a few years ago there was some funding sources that opened up that have really allowed us to kind of increase that projected revenue with the work that our that our folks are doing in that program area which has been very beneficial and, and brought in some increased revenue in that program mr. chair can I ask so uh, <clears throat> when you when you start talking about the um, nine you know the percentage of increases the and I'm, I'm going to the salaries benefits and that type of thing where you showed uh, 787,000 where do we show the portion of that that would be eligible for revenues for the 50 percent match where where is that in in your budget uh, Yep. You want me? So it, it is in our budget. Um, it's obviously not reflected in this summary, but it's it's right in our budget. And what we do is we once we have all of the administrative expenditures outlined, including salaries, then we have a formula where we apply that percentage, and then it's get it gets plugged in in two areas in the budget. Um, I can give you the budget line. Would that be helpful? Well, it, it, it just. So it is in here? It is in here. The anticipated yep. increase? It is, okay. it is included. The one thing that's unique and that we wanted to pull out to show you separately is those four positions that you approved to be fully funded under the health care unwinding. So 50% of those is the federal financial participation and the other 50% is that health care unwinding. So really, if you want to compare apples to apples, what you probably would want to do is take that seven for the salaries, the 787, 76 minus the 307 with the assumption, let's say you never added those four positions and we never had revenue, that's kind of the, the difference if you were going to compare apples to apples from your salaries. So 3%, 9%, plus I wondered with the change in steps where people are moving on the steps every year, mm -hmm. if that is, would the, if this would be the first year that we're seeing the bigger impact of that, I'm not sure, because that number seemed high to me as well in terms of a percent, but. Okay. Thank you. I guess I don't have anything else. What questions do you have for me? Commissioner Kravinoff. I 
I can see that a lot of place, um, a lot of home placements has been a, a struggle for a long time. Briefly, just what was the title for for the change? What what the, what does that mean? So in order to claim, so we used to be able to claim fifty percent. Uh, for cost of care. So if, if uh, a child went into care at a specific facility, we could claim 50% of what we were paying that foster parent in Title 40 eligibility. They've, they changed some rules with Families First legislation to really move everything towards prevention, which is great, um, but we lost some ability to claim that, that, that revenue uh, to the federal government, specifically um, uh, what's called a QRTP, Qualified Residential Treatment um, Facility. Uh, or placement, I'm sorry. And we see a lot of kids go to West Central um, that are placed, which is a, has a significant impact on the out-of-home placement budget. And with the requirements of Families First, it would have been very difficult to get West Central as a QRTP. Um, I think we had a lot of conversation with James to see if we could make that work. And I think background checks were a big, a, a big barrier to that, as well as some, I think it's some licensing between DHS and DOC um, and it was really too much of a hurdle yeah. to kind of jump over to get uh, the juvenile center as a QRTP and because of that any child that we're placing now at the at the juvenile center we're kind of losing that revenue um, I guess the good news with that is the money that we're paying to the juvenile center is still Clay County um, so we're kind of taking our money and giving it to the juvenile center when it comes to social services dollars that we mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah, it's just those, um, even though those um, trend lines, you know, of those placements are relatively steady, it appears, right? You know, just uh, um, the uh, the ability for that state cost share, that's what yeah. in that. And if you look at if if you look at that uh, graph in particular, what's been particularly frustrating for me, even as my role as child protection supervisor before this, was the number of kids that are going into placement has been decreasing or remaining consistent, which right. shows the awesome work that's being done by our child welfare folks. But the costs right. continue to increase. So that you know we kind of wanted our hard work in the in that realm to yeah. kind of. And obviously, it's a big one. So yeah, yeah. Exactly. Okay, thank you for that. Mr. Chair and Commissioners, if I could add um, on the out of home placement chart that you had in your packet, if you look at the, the chart, you'll start to see in 2023 the disparity between the middle line and the bottom line, which is really your expenditures from your revenues. The closer we can have those, obviously, the better. Um, and as Quinn said, the we spent, so in 2023, we spent 3.6 million, almost 3.7 in out-of-home placements. 1.5, a little over 1.5 of that was at West Central um, for our kiddos here. And that's when we started the inability to claim 4E on a number of those placements. We can claim up to the first 14 days, but beyond that, we can't. And so I think it was 14 or seven, sorry. 14. So that is creating that disparity between what we're spending and what we're able to collect. Mm -hmm. um, it, that's one part of it, but um, it's a pretty significant piece. Yeah. So can I, if I can, so what, is there anything that we could do at West Central that would, would allow us to continue with the collections we used to get? I, well, as Quinn said, establishing them as getting them certified as a qualified mental health treatment program is one thing, but there are a number of barriers to that. One of the things that we talked about is pulling together our placement committee again to review what, what that would take and whether that would make a difference. Um, to be honest, one of the big things to impact this is something we're already pursuing is that development of a PRTF. Because when you look at the various programs that are provided at West Central, stabilization program is one of them, which is a very, very high cost, and we're spending a lot of money in the stabilization program. And those are our kiddos that need a PRTF. 
And if they were in a PRTF, if they were in an appropriate level of care, we would not be billed at all for those kids because it's 100% paid by medical assistance. So, and, and, yeah. and, and so how many of our, and, and these kids are typically in the non-secure unit of the correct. West Central, right? So that's Clay County's, yep. we're not, that's not part where they're partnered with. So, you know, and I think at any one time we might have, what, 30 kids in there in non-secure? 25 to 25. To, how many of those uh, would you think would, would qualify to actually be under uh, PRTF? Would you say, I think I've had numbers in the past where you said maybe seven of those, is that? Yeah, we've done snapshots in time. <clears throat> okay, of your population, how many of those kids? And seven has been about that number. Mm -hmm. okay. But when we're talking the stabilization program, and I'm trying to remember what the rate is, by or it's over 500 a day. Yeah, for stabilization, it's the it's the kiddos with the highest needs. Yeah. So that it makes sense why it would be one of the most expensive options. And 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 so if they if there was a PRTF setting there, those seven kids would be fully paid for, outside of Clay County levy dollars. It's fully billable to MA, if they're not. Another reason why we <coughs> pursue what we want to do there. So, yeah, it is absolutely an impact on what we're seeing here for sure. And so, so again, Rhonda. So, it's my understanding of the PRTF. The kids that end up in there are that is, that is delegated by the medical in field, not. Um, Social services. Correct. Right. We, yes, that's correct, uh, Commissioner Campbell, Mr. Chair. We, um, a referral is made, and then they have to determine, they are determined to need that medical level of care in a PRTF. So it's similar to a hospital setting where they get prior authorization for placement and payment. Um, so that would be the process. Right. We couldn't just make a referral and uh, without that. Authorization yeah. process. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Hey, I'm just trying to understand all this yeah. as we kind of move forward with planning for this. I want to, you know, make sure that we're aware of. It's, it sounds like you have some opportunities here to um, that could have a positive impact on our budget too with the PRTF here. Yes. Uh, one area when it comes to placement and the and the the talk of the decreased revenue that's come with the placements. It's not included in the 2025 budget because I can't look you in the face and tell you I can say when it's gonna happen. But the Families First legislation that I referenced before kind of moves some of that billing from, instead of paying a, a share of when children go into placement, it allows for some of the prevention services to be claimed in, in federal funds. So kind of if you're gonna do the, the prevention work, that is gonna be billable to 4E instead of kind of paying for the ramifications afterward. Um, it's really exciting. Uh, uh, interviewing technique uh, called motivational interviewing is one of the services that will be uh, Title IV-E billable. Um, we're in the works uh, with some Family First Preservation Funds to bring in a motivational interviewing trainer for all of our child welfare and child protection staff to be able to capture some of that revenue. But again, I can't tell you when that will be, I guess, unwound by the state or when we'll actually be able to start billing that we just want to get everything in place so that day one when it's be when it becomes an option we can be ready for that to claim as much revenue as possible for that service that would help slightly in the decreased revenue but i can't guarantee that that would happen in even in 2025. any other questions You both did good. Thank you. Thank you much. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Commissioners. I wish I was bringing a little better news, not a 7% <laughs> for my exit, but uh, it's kind of where it sits right now. Worst case scenario, hopefully uh, some things will come in that will give us some good impact. But uh, we did a lot of work going through line by line on the budget, seeing where we could make some, some impacts, and hopefully... Uh, that will evolve over the next month or so. So thank you. 
I just wanted to say a big thank you to all of you for allowing that crossover period of time between Rhonda and I. Um, it was helpful, as, I bet. As I said in my interview, the budget was one of the things that I didn't understand as well as I wanted to, and the last six, seven weeks have been invaluable in working with Rhonda. It's really been uh, eye-opening uh, to see what that looks like, and I appreciate you all giving me the opportunity to have that time with Rhonda. So thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Well, it's a great resource for you, and one has been a great resource for the county for a long time. We're going to miss you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Hey, Aaron Brooks, our HR director. Aaron, tough act to follow. Yeah, I know. I'm going to have to talk to Sarah about putting me behind social services. <laughs> I mean, my whole budget is less than Rhonda's paycheck, so. Uh... <laughs> well, at least her pension check. <laughs> I'm feeling a little small and insignificant here uh, when I brief my budget. But uh, it, um, she's going to be very well missed and uh, I, I loved working with Rhonda. She's always been uh, extremely helpful for us. So to get to my budget, uh, I have uh, right now 3.5 people. Uh, I have Anna Moore, um, Melissa Young, and Sarah Heller and myself. And um, right now, as of today, we have 660 employees. Um, and I, it was funny because I, the other day I ran a report when I, four days after I got here in 2011 and we had 450 employees. So that's how much the county has grown in the past 13 years. Um, as far as the salaries and everything goes, uh, not much changes there. There was a slight change uh, due to the organizational structure that, uh, that um, Steve brought to you a couple weeks ago uh, on moving uh, the communications coordinator and, and Sarah picking up some of those duties. But the rest of it is, is pretty standard stuff. Um, in the uh, 6232 line, that's just lanyards and badges holders that we have to, to buy every so often. Um, most of my budget, as you look at it, is going to be travel and, and, travel and expenses and, and conference registrations. Um, right now, I go to, we, uh, HR has the uh, MPEL conferences that they go to, those two a year. That's the Minnesota Public Employee Labor Relations Association that we're members of, both myself and Anna. And then the MACRMA, which is the Minnesota County's Human Resources Management Association, they have two uh, conferences per year as well. And so uh, a, lot of, a lot of my budget is taken up, not only by salaries, but of, of course those um, travel and conferences. What we've started to do is that I will go to one Empower conference and one Macroma conference, and then Anna will go to the other one. So we're both getting training on those, those type of things. And then the fall Macroma conference is uh, one that Steve and I go, because it's combined with the, the MACA as well. As you know, I've also started to attend the AMC conferences, and uh, so that has upped my budget a little bit in that area. Um, Let's see, as mentioned before, um, my safety budget uh, has been transferred over to Joe Olson. He's uh, on the safety committee. He's kind of in charge of the safety committee right now, so it's not a big deal there. And um, I'm also this year the vice chair of the um, Minnesota Computer Consortium. Um, and so that probably requires one or two uh, trips to St. Paul that I normally haven't had to go to in the past. Most of the time, they're monthly meetings, but most of the time they're online, so it's, it's no real cost there. Um, so that was uh, an additional cost there. The other cost that uh, Mark had mentioned is we, were, we used to be paying for jot form, and it wasn't very much. It was only like $398 a year. Um, but then that moved over to Mark's budget. So I think he already briefed that this morning uh, in, in the GIS budget. Um, the only other increase really on there is the uh, 
David Drown Associates HR technical program. We get a ton of information from them. Um, it's it's kind of like our AMC for human resources, and we get newsletters, and we can um, uh, ask questions of DDA, and they, they respond within 24 hours if you have a question <laughs> about policies, laws, statutes, whatever the case may be, and um, that's been extremely helpful. That We were told at our last macrame meeting that that will probably, uh, the subscription to that will probably go up for next year, but they really didn't give us a number on how much that would go up. Um, it was $4,900 a year, um, she, and uh, Julie Ring said that it wouldn't go up um, past a thousand, you know, a thousand more dollars, which is kind of steep, I think. But uh, they're still working through that because it, it depends on how many other counties are uh, members of, and use that DDA. So the more counties that use it, the less the cost is. But um, so I just up up that a little bit. But I don't know if it'll be that that much of an increase once uh, all the counties come in and uh, say that they're going to use DDA uh, HR tech, technical program. Um, other than that, my, my budget is not too far different. I'm open for any questions. Questions? Uh, not just particularly for this thing, but all of our budgets that are going to be presented, our salaries, they could all be affected by this survey that we're doing, isn't it? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioner Gross, you're, you're correct. I think that uh, if you recall back five years ago when it was done, uh, based on your directives on how you prefer to move forward, um, Lori will then break it out for for the for the board as a whole, not in individual departments, but what that increase would look like. Thank you. Yeah. And just as a note, um, I do have David Darren Associates. Um, uh, Tessa Melvin coming on the 16th to the board for a closed session on the final results of that. So. Any other questions for Darren? Darren, thank you. Okay, thank you. Next up, we have committee reports. I believe Paul will lead us off. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, just to uh, mention a couple of events and uh, uh, as well as a couple of committee meetings that I had. Um, First event was thank you to staff and everybody. It was fun being part of the uh, county picnic we had on Tuesday after a meeting. It worked out. We had a good day, and it was uh, it's always fun being part of that. And, and appreciated all the cooking that Kurt pulled off. So um, I, I wanted the, the next day um, with the invitation on Commissioner Gross. Um, the water district, he had uh, heard they were doing tours up at a big dairy that's in, up in Gary, Minnesota. So um, uh, Commissioner Gross and I went up there and uh, took the tour, very impressed. Um, uh, it, it, our main reason I wanted to see it, number one, just being from a farm and around livestock to see what newer technology is. But the other thing is if um, ever, you know, we're getting uh, requests for something like this in like Clay County, it's good to see what these um, bigger operations, uh, how they operate and what they're doing uh, to mitigate some of the concerns with uh, uh, larger level, um, higher level uh, um, uh, livestock production. And so anyway, just a quick overview, it was uh, about nine, a herd of 9,000 uh, dairy animals. This is up by Gary, Minnesota. It's on a quarter section of land. Uh, they went through um, uh, the milking every day. Um, uh, 128 uh, cows on a carol cell that go around producing uh, roughly 70 pounds of milk a day. And it runs 24 hours a day. Uh, so it was interesting to see the efficiency and the productivity that comes out of those animals. Um, 
uh, the other, um, and of course it's class A milk, so everything's um, very clean. They also go to extra levels for um, covering the manure ponds. Um, I can tell you we were out there two hours, three hours, and uh, relatively no smell on the whole place. Um, so some of the complaints that we have in livestock, larger livestock production sometimes comes down to smells. And then the last thing I want to mention is for that little rural space, um, you know, economic development, if you look at that, um, they have, uh, provide housing for some of their workers. They work closely with um, uh, um, finding resources down in Mexico. Uh, working with visa programs for um, uh, technical people that are in in uh, in um, nutrition, um, veterinarian areas, as well as uh, working with different type of visas for their um, employees. Uh, through the employees, there are 13 kids fa uh, families of their uh, 45 employees, and you know that helps that school district in that area. So, anyway. Uh, it was. Uh, I'm glad we spent the time up there with uh, Frank and I, and, and uh, I was I was impressed. Uh, the next day, I had my uh, what I'm part of my first time uh, working along with social services, public health. Uh, I'm I'm part of now the core group uh, of the creative consulting work that um, is going on for family resource centers. Uh, the, it was really a first meeting uh, as a core team, I guess, working, um, identifying who's part of this. So, uh, again, I mentioned social service, um, public health. We have um, <clears throat> uh, privates uh, that, such as Head Start, Lakeland, um, Lotus. Uh, I mean, there, it's a full gamut of things of working with our community uh, to... Uh, increase awarenesses and outreach of the uh, resource services that we have here in the community as well within our county services. So um, this is all being funded by the Sauer Institution, and we will be having uh, meetings in uh, each of the months, July through October, and um, then the work that is done on a final work plan will move forward to the foundation, and then there may be... Um, uh, if, if uh, based on the work and the findings, another um, grant that will be um, uh, brought forward that the it can bring board, uh, an implementation uh, phase to everything that uh, we're trying to work with. Um, that night, uh, as part of the um, uh, early childhood initiative, we had the longest table event at M State. Uh, I volunteered at that, and um, anyway, well attended. Uh, uh, I, I didn't get the number, but there was a large number of vendors there <coughs> showing um, uh, resources again in, in the area. And um, I didn't hear what the actual number was, but I know it was over 250, so well attended. And instead of being outside, and um, unfortunately, uh, they made the decision to go inside and then we did have a pretty good rain shower, so it was the right move. And then last night I had uh, um, City of Moria Planning Commission. Uh, two things that were spoke about there. Uh, one was a um, text amendment uh, uh, amendment made for uh, aeronautical zoning overlay uh, for for Moorhead, and uh, um, that was uh, no concerns about the overlay. And then we had a nice presentation by Santec, and uh, they, they, they were talking about their updates for the uh, alternative urban area-wide reviews, and mainly uh, it's um, um, using a UARI, or a, I'm sorry, UAR for our growth areas in uh, northeast and south uh, areas of growth areas in Moorhead. And again, this is uh, working along with uh, environmental concerns and um, developing a mitigation plan that works more on a uh, overall growth area of mapping tool rather than what a specifics of a UAW and a EIS is. So 
anyway, it was informative and we um, approved that update uh, for city council. And with that, I'm done. Thank you, Commissioner Mojo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have two weeks of reports to report on. I attended the Metrocog policy board meeting. We did um, fail to get a quorum on the one day, so then um, had a special meeting on the following day. That always seems to be a, a bit of a difficulty in June to get a quorum there. But um, we did have a fairly lengthy discussion on um, the uh, transit development pro program plan. We had a consultant selection. They talked and approved the Dilworth 8th Avenue North extension study, um, RFP, the Kindred Comprehensive Transportation Plan, RFP, and then talked about the Metro Railroad Needs Study, RFP. There has been an offer and now prior, or in, since then is that an office manager employment um, hire, so we're excited to get that position filled. And then the 2023-2024 Unified Planning Work Program Amendment 5 was approved and the TIP Amendment 8 was then also approved. Uh, also had a Metrocog Executive Committee meeting in regards to that employment offer. I attended the CAP LP board meeting and um, that has been reported on last week by Commissioner Krabenoff who chaired that board. I attended the Lakeland Mental Health Center meeting. Uh, really good updates from the facility. Uh, they're looking at a one year, three year, and five year strategic plan update, working with the senior leadership team on that. They did have the county staff meeting with, or a county meeting with Rhonda and Quinn. Um, there was a uh, update on the construction. If you've driven by the Lakeland Center over by um, the old safari in South Moorhead, it really looks wonderful, it's beautiful. Hoping maybe to get an invitation to the board to look through that based on the work that they provide the county in so many ways, it would really be uh, great to see that. And then also, um, if you recall in Rhonda and Quinn's budget earlier, there's um, some Transim uh, uh, contracted work Transem is now working out of that facility too. It's really a great transitional employment office that helps folks in uh, transition for many different issues, but happy that they're able to co-locate there. Did have um, an update on psychiatry. If you recall from reports over the years, psychiatry is always really a tricky budget line item. Um, typically they budget at least a, a 65 to $100,000 loss in regards to the budget in that area just because of the high cost to provide that service. Looking towards um, hiring APRNs in that niche maybe, not it's not the all end answer, but an ability to provide half of the expense in that contracted area, but still uh, meet the need of the clients. And then they continue to look for um, grants in so many different ways. Um, all of the, the services in Clay County look really, really good. If you recall, children's services in Moorhead and children's day treatment in, in the past couple years has been a tricky line item, but they seem to have fine-tuned fine it well so that um, they're in the, the positive. I attended a, the Prairie Lakes meeting that uh, Commissioner Campbell will report on. He was there in person. I was uh, virtual. They did have a budget hearing on that um, earlier in the week. And I attended the SWAC committee meeting. There was a fairly lengthy discussion on the resource recovery doors. They're quite faulty and they're problematic and working with construction engineers on how to mitigate those. Ultimately, they need to be replaced. They were a, a really expensive high-end system, but for whatever reason, they're just not working at all. A uh, long discussion about batteries and lithium batteries for the public. Lithium batteries cannot go in the trash. They need to be recycled. They are the cause of of fires at our facilities, our landfill specifically, Holly Township has a, a fairly good and warranted concern on that. I saw Rep our, uh, Senator Kupek was at a facility in Greater Minnesota this week too and talked about uh, lithium batteries being a, a fire risk as well. So um, talked about how we 
reach out to the public to let them know that there are recycling opportunities for those batteries, but they cannot go in the trash as they do start fires. And then we talked about the business recycling uh, proposal that the board uh, approved earlier today. And then facility or um, uh, updates from the landfill and Commissioner Campbell updated on the Prairie Lakes. And then that afternoon, I attended the MCC JPA meeting uh, in person, uh, several different negotiations and summaries on that um, going forward. And then I also attended the diversion land management for FM land management meeting. We did have a fairly lengthy discussion on excess land dispersal um, and opportunities and, and certainly following the policy with that makes a lot of sense. However, there is a portion of the lands that need to be dispersed that um, are around that Horace elevator area. And um, it is such a large, um, large um, opportunistic area. And given the fact that Horace is growing at such a exorbitant rate, um, the prior policy didn't really seem to fit with that. Certainly offering that to the, in an auction to the, the market open market really seemed to make the most sense. So I know that they were having a discussion at the land, or at the diversion authority meeting on that, but that certainly followed within the um, discussion there. And then the only other issue is there was a long discussion on RIMP loan guidance. And I know that there were some comments, and I apologize, I was really sick last week, so I couldn't participate in the capacity in which I'd wanted, but um, there was some discussion at, and not in a favorable way to the RIMP loan guidance and uh, RIMP loan opportunities. And I really feel that um, given RIMP loans were written into the PRAM, which is the guiding document, the living, breathing document for how the diversion deals with uh, land, um, I really feel like it's a really good opportunity for uh, producers that are negatively affected by this project. And, and I understand it's not a not a um, maybe situation for every um, uh, purchase that they go through, but it's really a great opportunity for producers and would really be um, disappointed if that opportunity goes away. I know that they're dealing with several different negotiations on properties right now where that RIMP loan is going into part of that um, that. Um, negotiation. And so from someone who hears firsthand how helpful that has been, I'm hopeful that those of you that are on the diversion continue to advocate for the uh, importance of that. And um, other than that, I, I just want to say that I'm, I'm sorry, sad and sorry that I missed the county picnic. I didn't feel like sharing the, the sickness that I had with all of our staff would have been um, something that people appreciated. But I think the county picnic is one of the best things all year long that we have the ability to do, to be able to, to see all of our employees and, and, and get to show our appreciation for them is, is really a great opportunity to do so. So thanks to the um, supervisors and the rest of the commission that were able to take part in that. I'm sorry that I missed it, but that concludes my report. Thank you, and we appreciate you not giving our entire staff the flu, <laughs> but uh, you were missed as well. Thanks. Uh, there were, I got numerous. Where's Jenny? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> in bed. <laughs> Commissioner Campbell. Thank you. Uh, I want to echo Commissioner Mojo's comments regarding the um, county picnic. It was a great event. and. And hats off to all those who did all the hard work and our, our um, our dancing um, cook that uh, and provided the music and the entertainment always is uh, uh, quite a, quite something to be seen. Uh, so and then on, on uh, June 25th, we had a highway tracking committee meeting. We discussed the five-year plan. He, he proposed that, bring it forward. So that's going to be coming before the board at, and part of a, a public. Uh, process that's all going to happen during a board meeting coming up here soon. But one of the things that <clears throat> that he did bring up is that, and this would be new to, I think, both Commissioners Kravinoft and Hebinger, um, we had a, 
a county turn back several years ago to the road turn back to Moorhead. And as part of that turn back process, we, we had to make annual payments uh, to the city for that. And the last, and that was $400,000 a year. And the last payment on that um, is coming up this year now, and that's gonna be 398,000. And uh, so within his five-year plan, uh, Justin has um, suggested that we move that, that expense line over to the seal coating and striping budget that is needed. Um, there's some new re reflectivity rules coming out in terms of roads and all that. Type stuff. So that's a proposal that's there that uh, he presented to highway tracking. And that will be up to the boards uh, to make that decision um, based on the rest of his uh, proposals. Uh, he, he also had uh, the senior engineer retiring that we dealt with that this morning. Um, there's also going to, I believe he said there's going to be three motor grader positions between September and December that are going to be up uh, for retirements, uh, along with a shop foreman and one maintenance worker. So there's going to be quite a turnover through retirements and highway between now and December, and it's going to, that's going to be unfortunate because we've got it, had such a really good staff there. Um, and then we had a, re, a discussion and a request from BNSF regarding a, replacing a crossing panel on Casaw 31, and there's a cost share where that would that'd be $144,000 cost to us in the 2024-2025 budget. And the draft agreement on that is being worked on. Uh, the Holly shop, it's, it sounds like we're going to be ready to move into that at the end of July. Uh, there was a, because of the amount of um, the five acres that are there and the amount of grass that's there, they are requesting a purchase of a lawnmower for that. And um, he's established that there is a, an item within his internal service fund that's no longer going to be needed. And so the mower that they're talking about is one of these zero turn type deals because of the trees and stuff there's 15,000 and he's got 9,500 of that in internal service funds then he's uh, suggesting that the rest could be come out of his building and repair maintenance to cover the, the balance we also received updates on the CASA 1 and CASA 26 paving projects along with box culvert pro projects and dust control has been completed and it uh, for those, he's had a couple of calls because it doesn't look as dark. It's just a different chemical that's used there, but it's still it's still working like it's supposed to be. Just that when they laid it down, a lot of people were concerned that it it didn't look as wet or as dark in color. So, and just a couple of items that, on that regard that it's uh, we're going to really have to be um, looking at. Primarily, there's going to be three motor graders that are going to be due for replacement. And uh, the cost on those in 2017 was $319,000. And the cost in 2024 is 513000 Significant difference. But, you know, there was years ago when we changed that to turnover on those to a seven-year deal because at that point in time, we got, you could actually do that with, and, and really financially benefit. We may have to review um, that moving forward if a seven year turnaround is appropriate on some of those items that when you start start talking about that kind of increases. They have received two new plow, plow trucks. Um, and that, that concludes, my, Frank might have some more on that. On the 26th, we had the Prairie Lakes Solid Waste meeting. Um, we actually, we had a, Two meetings. We had a, had a budget meeting on the 24th, I believe, and then the um, Prairie Lakes meeting on the 26th. And what it, just on the, what it boils down to on the budget for 2025, the proposed budget would uh, amounted to a 3% tipping fee increase, which for Clay County's Solid Waste Department annually that would roughly be about a $9,000 increase to uh, Corey's budget, which he will incorporate into his um, budget that he's going to be presenting to us. Uh, we continue to have discussions about um, ash management. 
um, um, PFAS air emissions testing, and uh, we did a, we did finally approve that what we've talked about here before, and I know Commissioner Mojo had kind of advocated for a website for that facility, so that we could, you know, have better public information available to those who are interested in knowing what's going on in that facility, and a, a little discussion regarding internal controls on small areas where cash is collected and how you how you can monitor that. That's a typical thing in audits that we all kind of get dinged on where the, the cost to actually um, try to deal with it is much more than the benefit to do so. Uh, Thursday morning, we had a solid waste advisory committee meeting. Commissioner Mojo um, discussed that well. Uh, the issue on the doors at the transfer station is the biggest, well, it's a big concern as, long, as well as the batteries that she also talked about. I don't need to go into any more there. Thursday we had the, or that same day we had our uh, Mord Clay County Joint Powers. Uh, Commissioner Mojo did uh, give a good report on that and I really don't have anything to add to that report. Um, and then later that day we had our Division Board of Authority meeting and we continued to uh, work on a um, a human resources transition plan uh, for for our employees, diversion employees, and we continue to and we have it had a uh, an update on the co-executive director posi open position and the process of moving forward there. And I I think the timeline there is we might be able to review some applicants sometime in September. Yeah. I believe is the time frame that's there right now. FP out for the right, yeah, and then there will be a process, and then I, I think what it would amount to, there's going to be a subcommittee that might review some of those, and then there, there, you know, depending on the number of applicants, there could be three applicants that would come forward um, to the full board for consideration. Uh, we get construction projects updates. So we got a really good re uh, report from the Corps of Engineers from Terry Williams. Um, she was in person for this one. And Chris Bakicard gave a good project update, and uh, we've started receiving at the request of um, one of the Fargo commissioners a public safety update, and, and we've done pretty well. When you figure a project of that side and construction magnitude that's there, there's always the potential for injuries and that type of thing, and our project has been um, very well in that regard. Um, and I think that concludes my report. <clears throat> Thank you. Commissioner Gross. Um, last Tuesday, after meeting at Highway Tracking, which Commissioner Campbell has already pretty much covered that, um, but I was impressed with our new five-year plan is out, and looks like we've got a lot of construction going on in there. So um, hopefully we don't have to change too much of that as funds become available for the next five years. Um, after that, we had the picnic again. I also want to thank all our employees for coming to that. Uh, it was a good time for my last year to visit with all those people. It'd be nice to have all. I guess if we had all 600 there, we probably would have oh, ran out of food there because uh, I think the be beans were sort of in short supply. But uh, <laughs> we'll have to come up with a plan for that next year. Um, Wednesday, um, went to that dairy, which uh, Commissioner Kravinoff has already talked about it. I mean, the only thing I can add to that is just, wow. I mean, if you ever, I don't know if you grew up in a farm or not, but it's worth taking a tour of the, those places. And one of the main reasons I wanted to go to that, because um, just two miles west of uh, Halstead, there's going to be another dairy going in there. And that's going to be three times the size of this one. And he was talking about 128 carousel of 9,200 cows being milked daily, daily. I mean, they're going to have three carousels in the Halstead uh, or west of Halstead there, more in the Hillsborough area, I guess. And I'm looking forward to having a tour of that whenever it's built. You know, that's that's just an amazing project when they're looking at 100 employees and 25,000 
dairy cows there. It's just, um, uh, and the reason we sort of went to that is what it's going to be involved with is that dairy is going to be on the same water line that we're looking at possibly coming across at the Hill, Hillsboro area. So that's going to pick a big impact because they're going to look at using 1,200 gallons a minute. So um, it's really going to affect our water. We're going to have to have a big water line coming across there, a 16-inch water line. But North Dakota fields, they, I mean, uh, they can supply that water. And it's good to hear that. Um, and those are my two meetings. The other things, uh, did we get anything on the Morgan picnic coming up? Uh, is it July 8th or something like that? Has that come out? Or? It is. Uh, I did get a uh, letter end of last week. It is the 8th, yes. It is on the 8th. Okay. I was just going to make people aware of that. Some of our people have been speaking of that all the time, and it's really a good. They normally have a pretty good attendance, and I recommend if any of our people want to go to that. I don't want to be the one inviting people to the Morgan picnic, but uh, it's good to have you there. They're very appreciative of anybody showing up. Um, and that's pretty much my report. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, on the uh, 25th, last Tuesday, I also attended the employee picnic. And not to be echoing everybody, but it's just great to see our employees. We have a good bunch on board, and it's it's nice to that we can be part of hosting them. It's something I really enjoyed. Good good group of people. Um, on Wednesday, the 26th, I attended the Diversion Authority Finance meeting. It was pretty much a regular. Uh, we addressed uh, the financial report and approved the bills. Nothing real big on the agenda. We uh, handled the MOUs and the. Uh, contracts that came up. Uh, we, the Diversion Authority did have a positive uh, report for their audit. On Thursday, I, I virtually attended the Greater Fargo-Moorhead EDC joint meeting with the Chamber. Um, did a, uh, they, there was a pretty uh, strong presentation by Charlie Johnson from the Convention Visitors Bureau, along with uh, one of the owners of the Brujala. And in light of the failed um, tax uh, movement for the dome that they had in the last, last uh, vote that Fargo had, they are looking at a public-private partnership and a vote to maybe put in an, a uh, convention center, hotel, and other facilities out just west of Brujala and try and open that part of Fargo up as sort of a entertainment or a recreation district. There's a great deal of talk on that. Uh, Shannon Fool from the chamber was there. Um, they had discuss discussion on the joint board report that we had, and there's a feasibility study looking at uh, joining the operations from the EDC and the board. Uh, one of the things I think that came of interest to me is they had a role matrix and in looking at um, the relevant function that each uh, that the board and the chamber would make, all of the uh, primary uh, aspects of public policy would be handled by the chamber. I did not see any uh, strong, it's all secondary for uh, public policy by the EDC. And then there was a lot of talk, concerns over the property tax referendum that North Dakota's having. And there will be some ramifications if that passes, and the chamber is very concerned about that. Um, Later that day, I uh, attended the Diversion Authority Board of Authority meeting uh, that's already been reported on by Commissioner Campbell, and I think he did a good job. We did have uh, one thing Fargo named their members on the Diversion Board for next year. It'll be Commissioner Kolpeck and uh, Commissioner Pepcorn. And then yesterday, I... Uh, attended 
Clay County was invited or the, the chair was invited. I was invited to the, uh, the uh, municipal airport function that they had. Uh, Hector International is doing expansion with a parking garage and they've already got uh, uh, new terminals being built in there. It's very impressive. It was great attendance. They had uh, Doug Burgum, John Hoven, Kevin Kramer, representative uh, from uh, Representative Armstrong's office, uh, and then uh, Mayor Mahoney, Mayor Dardis, and Pro Tem Mayor uh, Hendrickson spoke. Just a good turnout, and he shoveled some dirt, and this is something that's gonna impact our region as much as any, and I'm glad that they're moving ahead with it. It's a good-looking program. And that completes my report. Steve? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, last Tuesday, I participated uh, in the appreciation picnic. Again, thank the commission for, uh, for again, being the face of delivering the food with us. Uh, uh, I know that the, the employees appreciate that, and it's fun to celebrate. Uh, really, the, the employees are the backbone, and we're fortunate to have, have great people here at Clay County. And so yeah, it's good to, again, as been mentioned, one of my favorite days. Uh, so uh, highway tracking uh, has been uh, covered in detail. Uh, I think that uh, participated on the 26th with the pre-budget meeting uh, for highway, uh, and so you'll be uh, hearing that next week. Uh, that afternoon participated with Darren and Lori in uh, AMC tax, tax forfeiture uh, webinar, again with, uh, with uh, legislation, uh, Supreme Court's action in, in striking down the tax forfeiture law. Uh, and the, it addressed kind of the payment, the payment process, the seven year look back, uh, and also as they move forward uh, with, the new, with new legislation uh, to, uh, to uh, make sure we meet the standard moving forward of how that works. And so uh, there'll be more on that. On the 26th, uh, we, we participated, or I participated in election emergency procedures. Uh, this year, the Secretary, Secretary of State required each county to have uh, procedures in place if you have different issues. Uh, as elections uh, came, we had two different sessions where we uh, had uh, training for, for county staff and election staff. Uh, and again, thanks to Mark Sloan and Gabe uh, for uh, putting forward that uh, training. 27th, uh, participate in the SWAC uh, meeting that uh, has been addressed. I would just note that next Monday, uh, we're scheduled to meet uh, in regards uh, to that door issue with uh, Joe construction, uh, construction engineers and also Burns and Mac, hopefully get some resolution there. Um, the 27th, I met with Don Mart Martadam uh, in regards to the Board of Directors. Uh, also uh, participated in the MCCJPA meeting that's been addressed. 28th, uh, I did meet with Scott Fettig uh, in regards to a number of the projects. We did uh, discuss, as Commissioner Campbell brought forward uh, last year, some of the dis last week, some of the discussions that we've had in regards to the PRTF planning. Uh, we're working to get the final the final number exactly from from uh, Brian McCarthy in regards to what we spent, uh, but it's gonna be right around that $20,000 range plus some expenses. If you recall, uh, this board approved $107,550 for that, that pre-design, and so um, plus $2,000 in reimbursable fees. And so uh, more to come on that. Uh, yesterday I participated in the uh, pre-budget for IT and facilities, which will be coming forward. Uh, just a note, uh, I think you've all received uh, an email uh, I forwarded to, to uh, from James uh, that uh, had some additional answers to the QRTF question. Again, I think as was addressed, part of it is a significant portion of that is a licensing issue. Even though non-secure is, uh, is considered non-secure because it's in the same facility, uh, it, would require, it would require a DHS license which creates uh, several challenges in addition to cost and also just from a licensing perspective. Uh, also, I know that this board has been uh, extremely uh, involved in making sure that we have uh, fingerprints. That also becomes part of the reimbursement issue. Uh, when we have a one staff member in that facility that's not, doesn't have a completed background check, the entire facility is uh, not allowed to collect uh, the four E eligibility funds and so, uh, that's a pretty significant issue too. And the last thing, again, we will be closed uh, July 4th in observation of the 4th of July. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Campbell. Yeah, thank you. I just want to go back to um, the PRTF discussion and 
where we'd been with Klein McCarthy and and uh, last week, you know, I gave that update on on you know different opportunities that we might have moving forward. And I know Commissioner Mojo was um, out ill, and uh, so I, I did have an opportunity to um, have a discussion with her regarding what we had talked about and. I, you know, I, I think I think we should be at the point, and I'm glad to see that we're not too deep into those costs that we had authorized Klein McCarthy to do on the PRTF. Um, in 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 regards to a new building for that, but I would like, you know, I think we just need to keep this thing moving forward, and I and I think I think it would be good for us to um, have Steve come forward with a. Um, presentation or an option then to use those remaining funds that we that were not spent to um, further um, plan for the ability to maybe have a a separate location for uh, non secure slash transitional housing um, you know in the event that we're we're successful in in switching that first floor of that facility to a PRTF. So I don't, you know, I, I think I think we should. I, I just don't want us to, you know, when when we're going to down the road, we're going to be ask, asking Commissioner Kravinoff and Mojo to work on, um, you know, legislative funding f for this plan. I think the sooner we can give them the appropriate data to make that request, the better off we'll be. So, I hopefully we can expedite that process. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioners, I, in part of our discussion with Scott is he's on vacation this week, and so um, if that's the board's wishes, I'll reach out to him and uh, bring forward a, a, a proposal for this board to consider. Okay. Have we got a meeting schedule, PTRF? Uh, was there a meeting schedule for Monday, or is that... Uh... Um, we've determined that we're going to put a hold on those meetings until we, okay. this board makes a decision how to move forward. Very good. All right. Anything additional? Are we okay with him working with Scott to? Yeah. I, yeah. Motion, I think we just direct as through consensus that should be plenty. I have the county administrator talk to him. I don't think it's an action item. I think that would be a, be appropriate. It would the action will come with your decision of whether to accept the the proposal or not. Okay. Thank you. Darren, anything? You spoke already. Well, Jack, you're back. I'm sure you've, you've been holding up and you've got a whole lot for us. <laughs> Welcome back. And with that, we're adjourned.